one and all. A warm welcome to everyone present. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on artificial intelligence for cyber security. To begin with the webinar, I now request the executive director sets, Dr. Sharachandra Babu, to deliver the welcome address and give us the opening remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Forum. Good morning and welcome you all to this uh, one day webinar on artificial intelligence for cybersecurity. And uh, first of all, let me welcome all the speakers who have accepted to deliver through this uh, webinar their knowledge that they gained in artificial intelligence for cybersecurity, which is a topic of uh, interest world over. And I also thank all delegates who have participated in a very short time, showing the keen interest in this area of research and um, academic activities. And also let me welcome all our senior officers who are joining from our uh, principal scientific advisor at the Government of India's office. And especially thank Dr. Preeti Panjal and uh, Dr. Arun Bharadwaj, who are instrumental in encouraging us to work in this AI for cybersecurity area. And I welcome all our colleagues, speakers once again. It's an uh, SETS, as you know, it's a R&D organization offering cybersecurity solutions in different areas of security, name it hardware security, and cryptology and computing, network security, and recently we started quantum security. So all these areas, we do the scientific long-term research and also trying to get usable products, uh, prototype products in due course of time. So these are uh, this office works under the uh, support of principal scientific advisor to the government of India. I well, I thank uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan, uh, principal scientific advisor to the government of India, for encouraging us to carry out research in this uh, important area at a national level. So I just uh, would like to say a few words because I know there are excellent speakers lined up from uh, Dr. Ananda Mohan, sir, well-known cybersecurity expert, and uh, Professor Chester, Professor Richard Astogi, and our own team members, Dr. Prem, Mitran, um, Samyukta, Ishwari, and probably I missed anybody. Uh, so these are the speakers, and uh, I welcome them as well as thank them who are going to make us an important uh, day of uh, through contributing the, their knowledge. Okay, so SETS keeps on doing these webinars, so you can always watch our website, setsindia.in, uh, for uh, future workshops, webinars, etc., or other activities as well. So you are all aware today, A, nobody need to explain what it is, artificial intelligence, which is uh, inspired by the human and human intelligence and uh, trying to mimic what human is doing. In fact, it's uh, nature is uh, understanding the brain uh, and trying to see how computers can behave as brain behaves. And similarly, um, uh, simulating the brain for the advantage of the medical, uh, you know, the diagnosis and all. These are mutually inspiring each other, computing and the human and uh, so in the process what we try to look at is the human by nature he plans right and he does the learning uh, reasoning okay, problem solving and including social intelligence and also creativity so we know that way back in uh, 70s 80s we got the expert systems which were all uh, if then based and uh, rules and facts and uh, based on the experts domain expert inputs that we have got and we used to have earlier a expert systems and uh, parallelly there was a field neural networks is happening in right from 60s but it has its own uh, you know uh, uh, you know some kind of discontinuities due to assumption that it won't work as they planned and finally rumble hearts uh, back propagation uh, algorithm has encouraged people to you know look at that okay exclusive or problem could be solved in you know the particular domain so the this kind of a interesting observations and then 
it never looked back. But then in 90s, it still uh, couldn't proceed because of the lack of required resources in the form of computing, communication, storage, etc. But today, you know, there's a lot of computing power. You name it as a CPUs or a GPUs. OK, so we are crossing the moon. We are, in fact, the speed at which we are going now, we're also looking at quantum computers, right? So most to satisfy most law and beyond, I think we are even looking for the quantum computing. So this is the kind of resources that are available. And uh, this has really made the what we uh, people thought of as, uh, you know, uh, fiction uh, doable now in the area of artificial intelligence. In addition to these are the things, computing, communication, technology resources, but the same technology has also helped to get very critical thing. There is an oil for this, that is the data. The data was not available earlier. The limited data on which you take decisions and then we had some issues. Now the data, you know, in fact, uh, all these social media platforms, you have data of uh, different types and uh, stitch to get whatever inference that you want. Only disadvantage is the data, entire data is available with few platforms. Okay, they are able to you know, come out with a lot of interesting products and do. It's not easily available for the other researchers. So there are efforts from at various countries to provide data uh, test beds for uh, carrying out the research in different directions. Right. So this is the kind of a thing, and uh, there are, uh, AI is going to stay, and it's uh, I think we are all day to day intelligent homes and Alexa. Everything is you no. Know, we are all enjoying the uh, you know kind of uh, expertise that is. Uh, already happening through artificial intelligence, but there are concerns. Uh, any technology has is a double edged sword, and uh, we have some concerns like, uh, uh, for example, the it invades privacy and there are uh, fake news molding someone's opinion, and there are also biases based on the inputs that we give. Probably it is a particular section of the people or a particular section of uh, society. It is uh, advantage and giving a disadvantage to the other. So these are the concerns. You know, with all these things, of course, the title of the topic today, the security, and A is uh, predominantly used today for cybersecurity solutions, for the log analysis, intelligent analysis. Okay, so uh, the data that is collected earlier, the packets, the, the speed at which the networks are working and the flow of information that have we have is the artificial intelligence now using the neural net based deep learning techniques or the statistically uh, algorithms like machine learning they are able to arrive at new so new uh, ideas for cyber security traditional uh, things like intrusion detection system etc are also uh, taken care uh, they all use uh, a kind of uh, uh, machine learning based algorithms today and uh, the next generation uh, security products are all going to be you are definitely having some component or other of a in the form of ml or dl okay so this is the kind of a situation so a is definitely useful for cyber security it probably reduces the mundane tasks of the system administrators there that they will use their uh, you know uh, brains to address the new new things and it will probably give in a queue for the zero day attacks and so on and so forth so the, there is it's a definitely well thought of and uh, AI is used for cyber security, but the same AI is also used by the hackers to do the reverse thing, how the organizations are taking care of using AI. So how to subvert uh, and uh, use the AI techniques to still attack. This is a kind of game happening. OK, so at this point of time, uh, we were also looking at the other way, cyber security for AI. See, now we are entire world is going to depend on AI, then you have, that is also a um, IT system, so it has to be secured. So that is going to be a big thing because there are attacks happening in data poisoning and uh, algorithm poisoning and model attacks. These are all to be addressed so that what we see and what we get from AI is really what we want. So that's the kind of an object too, right? Today I feel Dr. Prem is going to explain to us the overview or preamble of the workshop various speakers, what they talk and all. So at this point of time, I would like to stop here and to uh, welcome you all once again. And I'm very sure that it's the speakers are um, have uh, lined up very important topics and uh, it, it will be useful for the research and academic development and also to know the state of the art that's happening in various uh, directions of uh, thing. Of course, this is one such a webinar. 
webinars keep happening in different areas and uh, keep looking at it once again. So I today cyber security is an important thing. So the number of attacks that are happening, especially data centric data breaches are happening. And one more was the ransomware. And uh, so with this kind of latest attacks like lock 4J, so all these attacks probably require AI based solutions. And similarly, you have to secure AI systems. Both have to be uh, taken care. So I'm sure this uh, seminar or webinar will address all those issues and we'll have a very good learning time. Thank you all. And once again, uh, thank the coordinators, uh, Dr. Nagesh Rao and Dr. Mesha Mitran, who have tirelessly worked on organizing this along with the speakers. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, sir for the very encouraging initiation and for setting the rapport. Uh, I now request our senior scientist, Dr. Prem Lakshman Das, who is leading the cryptology and computing research group at SETS to give the overview for the webinar. Over to you, sir. So namaste one and all and welcome to this uh, workshop. So uh, special welcome to the speakers and the organizers and all the participants. Um, so when we talk about this uh, AI and CS, two themes emerge according to me. So one is AI for CS and CS for AI. So I see that the theme of the webinar today is AI for CS. So that is how can you use AI for making better cybersecurity solutions and products? So let us just take this theme uh, first of all and see that uh, meaning there is a lot of work going on according to me in the area of uh, designing uh, ML enabled intrusion detection system and also for empowering uh, the system to uh, recognize and thwart malware attacks. So uh, ML can be used for making these two network security problems, um, meaning solutions to these problems sharper. Right and uh, so the common perception I found is that uh, meaning there is a lot of uh, meaning um, uh, re reliance on e uh, ML for making such tools sharper and then moving towards uh, automation and independence from human intervention uh, for such tasks. So there is a lot of uh, industry involvement in developing such uh, tools um, which can meaning act as next development net network security um, solutions. So there is a uh, meaning I just found one report by this uh, Center for European Policy Studies, CEPS. Uh, in May 2021, which uh, kind of charts the scope and the policy issues in this domain. So this is about this uh, AI for CS. See, other other theme which emerges is CS for AI. So uh, there is a lot of work which uh, meaning which uh, uh, people are doing in uh, making what is called uh, adversarial machine learning. So uh, the adversary who is active, so he can um, attack the ML system at its various stages by uh, meaning making some poison data, uh, meaning inserting some poison, poison data, model poisoning, et cetera, et cetera. So there is again another uh, um, meaning whole area of research which is emerging, which is kind of building a ML system, which is um, meaning robust against such adversarial attacks. So these being the two themes, so we can say that uh, AI for CS and CS for AI, so these are the two thing, two themes which emerge, um, meaning under this AI CS umbrella. But uh, this webinar is more about AI for CS, and there will be some um, meaning CS for AI too. Okay. So I just want to mention that uh, SETS coordinated a task force for bringing out a report on this theme of AI and CS. So that report is now accessible from our website. So those who are interested can take that report and see that what is the what is the landscape. OK, and uh, meaning coming to the workshop per se. So I want to thank all the um, distinguished external speakers as well as meaning our colleagues from sites who are uh, going to talk today. So I see that uh, there are two, three themes which uh, meaning emerge in the talks. Um, uh, which are lined up today. So the first one is about the hardware and ML. So there are two persons who are going to talk about uh, this. So one is uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Professor Chester from IIT Madras and my uh, colleague uh, Ishwari Devi from SETS. So they're going to talk about how you can use machine learning for making um, um, meaning site channel analysis better on the one hand. 
and on the other hand, how do you mount attacks on your uh, implementation of your machine learning algorithm, right? So these are the two talks which fall in the theme of uh, cyber security, sorry, hardware security versus ML. Okay. So next, uh, meaning our distinguished professor Rajas Singh from IIT Jodhpur will talk about dealing misinformation in the visual world, right? And uh, my fr good friend, Mr. Ramesh Naidu, uh, will talk about trustworthy and explainable AI. So this is uh, more towards uh, meaning CS for AI, according to me. And <clears throat> there is this uh, DL enabled network security solutions that uh, uh, kind of emerges as a theme in which uh, two of my colleagues, Mitran and Samyukta, will talk about uh, meaning talk under this uh, umbrella. So Mitran will talk about uh, DL enabled malware, malware analysis and Samyukta will talk about uh, DL enabled ideas, right? So, and our distinguished uh, meaning speaker, Dr. Anand Mohan will talk about private AI. So as uh, sir said, uh, meaning Anand Mohan sir is a yeah, meaning kind of a, a mentor and uh, father figure to sets. So he's uh, uh, meaning ever present in all our events. So like that, so he's going to talk about private AI uh, in his uh, meaning, um, first uh, talk. So with this, I would like to uh, just uh, meaning conclude and uh, make way for the first speaker, who is Dr. P. V. Anand Mohan. So he is uh, going to talk from Bangalore. So over to you. Sir. So forum, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the very precise overview and giving us a very clear picture. Uh, so uh, uh, before we begin, uh, just a little housekeeping. So before we start with the talk of uh, Dr. Anand Mohan, sir, uh, to the audience listening, if you have any questions, uh, the chat box is uh, uh, activated. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, put them onto the chat, chat box. And uh, we will read the questions over to the speaker after the presentation. And the, the speaker will answer after the presentation. So. Uh, uh, we will now begin with the talks for the day. Uh, so uh, our, I now take immense pleasure in introducing our first speaker for the day, Dr. P. V. Anand Mohan, as uh, Prem sir already said. Uh, though he does not uh, need any introduction, I will still go ahead with it. Uh, he will be giving the keynote address. So uh, Dr. P. V. Anand Mohan obtained his PhD degree from IISC Bangalore in 1975. Since 1973, he has worked at the R&D ITI Limited Bangalore at various levels for more than three decades and was heading the R&D division of ITI Limited Bangalore. Then he moved to ECIL Bangalore as an executive director and later to CDAC Bangalore as technology advisor. He has published five books on analog filters and residue number systems and several papers in IEEE transaction and IETE journals. He is life fellow of IEEE, fellow of National Academy of Engineering and FIETE. And as Prem sir rightly mentioned, he uh, continues to be a guide to sets in all our endeavors. So, so sir, uh, over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. One thank minute. you, sir. One minute. You are able to see the presentation? Yes, sir. We are able to see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Good morning. So let me first thank Dr. Sarasthandra Babu and uh, organizers for inviting me to give this uh, keynote. I am not expert in AI, but you know some exposure is there. So with, uh, with that little exposure, I will try to say whatever is uh, required. Actually, you know, I will be focusing on the second uh, aspect, like the cyber security for A more. But uh, first I will give a little introduction about uh, what is, uh, I know, what are the problems in cyber security and how A can be 
used. Now, you know, artificial intelligence, as you know, was, uh, uh, you know, actually, you know, introduced in 1943, and then uh, John McCarthy was introduced in 1956. So, this, you know, basic definition is to make systems handle information, and then, you know, perform procedures to uh, do some tasks that are considered intelligent if performed by human, because human has got uh, information, you know, ability to infer and uh, be creative also. So, if machines also can do that, then uh, obviously, you know, this uh, they will be uh, mimicking the human brain. Now, yeah, a lot of terminology is there, you know, like uh, this has started long ago, and, uh, and you know, this uh, many variations are there, like, you know, machine learning, expert systems, then uh, deep learning and all. So what happened was in uh, olden days, you know, this maybe because of computing facilities and uh, uh, other things being less, you know, this there was not much development. But uh, now, you know, you see there is a lot of uh, advances in VLS technology and then all this, you know, GPUs and uh, you know, networks that like, you know, internet and all. So this has become uh, feasible now. That's why, you know, a lot of trust is there in areas like uh, uh, no big data, cloud and all. So, because all these have interconnected the world, a lot of problems have come. So, that's why, you know, now uh, AI should be used for solving those problems. So, expert system, you know, used to be, uh, you know, just, uh, just designed to you know, work as per set of some pre-configured rules. Okay. Then, uh, later machine learning. Care. So, machine learning, you know, comes from uh, label data and it is called supervised learning. And then, you know, more recently, deep learning has come because of the proliferation of uh, uh, GPUs. And, you know, these actually artificial neural networks were analog in the beginning. That is, in uh, 1917, actually, one book came from uh, somebody. So, uh, they actually suggested, you know, uh, this, uh, why can't you use op amps? And then, uh, you know, all resistors, some such things, and design a neural network. Because, you know, reason is, uh, so, you know, if you look at the deep learning networks, you find that there are a lot of neurons. Then, then you know, this each neuron will get inputs from various uh, neurons in the previous layer. So, how real-time summation can be done? Analog circuit can do this much faster than a digital circuit. Because digital circuit, you know, you have to you know, add A with B, then result with C, like that you have to do. Whereas, you know, digital analog circuits can do. But then what happened was scalability was an issue. And then... Uh, this that's why you know analog uh, implementations were not uh, uh, popular and people have abandoned actually but now again the thrust has come because of the advancement in uh, uh, digital technologies now here you know basically any ai systems if you see this uh, there are things like uh, you know first uh, there is a learning phase where you know you have to acquire data then you have to perhaps you know cure the data then you know we have to build some uh, uh, models then train them and test them then afterwards you know you get uh, this lower one you can see you can real time data you know you may be getting then uh, again you have to curate and on this you know the development models can be used to get some results okay and then based on the experience of your results then you can uh, this uh, provide updates to the model that means you know this uh, my, this is continuously this evolves it is not i think like a uh, fixed system or anything. So, learning can be, you know, four types, that is supervised learning, then uh, semi-supervised learning means it will, can accept some partially labeled data and partially unlabeled data, and then uh, unsupervised learning is uh, totally unlabeled data, this is what of most interest today, and then the reinforced learning is this, you uh, know, you can use your experience, you know, gained uh, to do uh, learning in a uh, adaptive manner. Now, you know, if you see what are the challenges in uh, this AI systems, you know, uh, this have taken from ETSI. Now, you know, it's very interesting that many bodies like uh, NIST, that is National Institute of Standard of Technology, then, you know, this uh, European, uh, this uh, so, so, uh, that is societies and all, you know, they have started uh, showing interest. So, that's why they want to develop some standards for this. So, these are things they will equally, you know, like... Uh, each, you know, phase in which I have shown you in the previous uh, flow uh, is having problem. That means uh, anybody can attack that and, uh, you know, may do something. So that's why you know, we have to see data acquisition, uh, data curation, then model design, 
then uh, software building, then training, testing, deployment, upgrades. That means, you know, in every stage of this, there is a question of uh, some security, you know, like uh, maybe integrity, sometimes, you know, confidentiality, availability. So all these issues are there. That means every stage it is there. So that means, you know, end to end, we should try to provide this uh, security. Now, you know, in fact, in some of the systems, there may be uh, complaints are there that, you know, many systems, you know, when uh, data is uh, selected, there can be bias. That means, you know, you can manipulate such that it produces certain uh, desired outputs. That means, you know, I want to say uh, this something is bad in this country. I can uh, shoot this data, you know, and to uh, see that and remaining data I may drop and so that I will get that result. Similarly, there can be sometimes selection bias, you know, like uh, this, uh, suppose I want to survey on some population, I can only go to particular place so that, you know, the whole population is not uh, considered in uh, arriving at some of the results. Now, there are numerous attacks that are possible on uh, this, uh, you know, every level I have mentioned already, you know, like, you know, you can poison the uh, data set. Okay, then, uh, in fact, you know, in some of these applications like uh, big data, you know, there is something like provenance. Provenance means uh, you can, uh, you have to say uh, this, uh, that somebody should be able to identify the data which has been put there has come from this particular person. So that means, you know, maybe you have to use techniques like, you know, hashing and then digital signatures so that, you know, traceability is there because somebody otherwise, you know, can always uh, mess up with the data. So, you know, this, uh, that, uh, some, like this, some precautions we have to take. Similarly, somebody can do the algorithm poisoning and somebody can do the uh, model poisoning. I think next lecture, you know, some uh, vault attacks are going to be discussed by Professor Chester. So, you know, where some, sometimes, you know, you can you know, poison this uh, model. I can create faults. Uh, faults. Similarly, you, know, you can attack at the inputs. Then you can uh, do attacks using some uh, back doors. Then you can do reverse engineering to extract the model. Then, uh, similar, you know, like this, many attacks are there. So, uh, these uh, deep fakes are there, fake conversations are there. So, that means, you know, these are all the attacks that can be done on the, uh, this uh, AI system. Now, what are the goals now for us in uh, uh, cyber security? Goals are, you know, uh, huge data is there, that is 15 millions of alerts and, uh, you know, uh, so identify, you have to identify uh, this uh, true uh, from false positives at certain level of accuracy. So that means finally accuracy is very important criteria and you have to discover uh, patterns across the input data, you know, automatically. Then uh, you have to provide actionable recommendations. That means you have to analyze the data and then uh, you have to learn from past behavior uh, to recommend relevant insights or suggestions to provide new context. You know, that's why you know, suppose uh, nowadays what you find, zero day attacks, you know, we are not able to uh, detect. So once you, uh, once a lot of, uh, you know, systems are spoiled, then only you get, uh, you know, maybe you can get some protection for antivirus or malware or something. But till that time, some destruction is taking place. So now the question is how to, uh, the whole cyber security professionals address that. That is, can you find out, you know, uh, by looking at this, uh, some of these anomalies and all, and uh, prevent this, that means uh, no attack should be first possible. So that is the final uh, goal. Now, you know, this deep learning has proliferated because of the availability of uh, uh, big data sets. Okay, and then uh, this uh, GPUs have in fact accelerated because, you know, a lot of uh, uh, parallel processing GPUs can do. And that's why, you know, most of these uh, tools also are aligned towards uh, uh, application uh, to uh, application on uh, running on GPU. Then conversion neural networks you know, have been widely used in uh, all these you know, applications like uh, pattern recognition, image processing, face recognition, and then uh, natural language processing, voice detection, and other applications. Now, what are main challenges here is uh, because of the interconnected world. Uh, no, we have got geographically distant IT systems. That means uh, these systems are not in one place. So, how to just uh, no, no, find out uh, track accidents in uh, such a uh, this geographically distant uh, networks? Similarly, you know, uh, what they found manual threat detection, you know, is very time consuming. So, that's why, you know, uh, whether some amount of automation can be done using uh, artificial intelligence. 
then cyber security you know is basically uh, reactive till now that means once i was mentioning you know once something as damage has happened then only will do so now whether ai can uh, solve this problem much before damage has occurred then uh, hackers also become very intelligent that means uh, they also know that how to uh, hide their address uh, ip addresses and some of the attacks are uh, occurring in the payloads instead of uh, headers you know because some system firewalls and all may be looking at the this uh, you know ip headers but you know i can uh, put something you know in the payload and i can do so that's why you know this uh, we have to that means you know the hackers also become intelligent so we have to become more intelligent than the, this and more serious problem is Uh, global cyber security skills shortage because it has been estimated that uh, around you know 100000 people are required you know, who are experts in uh, cyber security but uh, uh, very few people are there because you know many most organizations have just got one uh, chief information security officer and no staff at all many because we have been uh, at cida you know we have been interacting with some of the banks they have got only 1% for the whole bank in head office to worry about the Uh, this uh, cyber security so that is a big uh, uh, there is a big problem that means interest should be there first uh, for the uh, you know organization to protect their assets and information and uh, at the same time you know they should be able to spend some money because uh, this requires investment now what are the possible benefits of using i uh, ai is uh, it can offer instant insights that means very fast because we are using uh, you know uh, very Uh, complicated uh, computing power and uh, so that that is the advantage and it can identify irregularities uh, by analyzing uh, you know user action in fact most of the you know is uh, dealing with the uh, actually behavior of the uh, this uh, uh behavior of people or uh, uh, behavior of people or be pvs attacks you know so uh, they say that's why they have ability to distinguish uh, malicious signals from benign signals okay and then uh, by, by human operators you know more problem is sometimes you know uh, you can't go on uh, looking at uh, machines and uh, seeing what is happening what threat is there and all that so this machines can do this job much uh, faster okay now uh, this i will skip now you know how ai enhances uh, cyber security is uh, this uh, threat detection now you know for example traditional techniques use only signatures to identify threats but suppose you know signatures also now what is happening there many genetic variations are coming like suppose you know you have got a hash of a particular uh, this virus and store what people are doing they change the this uh, virus and uh, slightly and then uh, numerous variations i can create so that's why you know it has become uh, very difficult to do, uh, do like that now yeah that way you know can perhaps even detect even genetically modified uh, uh, this uh, malware and trojans etc and uh, this can increase detection rate up to uh, maybe 95% that's what people are predicting and uh, you know, this of course you know false positives can be there so what people have cautioned is uh, this uh, there are two types of ai actually known as weak ai and uh, strong ai that is you know weak ai means uh, there may be some jobs you know where uh, even if mistakes are done it is uh, it can be tolerated okay but suppose you know you are using car in a car uh, some uh, for uh, some ai let us say that is that is not weak ai is not acceptable because you know you have to use a uh, strong ai code so what they have told is that uh, ai you can use but you should be aided by uh, human uh, uh, involvement so that you know this uh, detection rate can be uh, much higher and false positives can be eliminated now you know this uh, vulnerability management can be also is important in cyber security you know so for this again people are focusing on uh, user and event behavioral uh, analytics because you know this analytics now can be done by machines much faster than uh, human being so even before vulnerabilities are reported this can help protects the uh, organization now you know this uh, data centers you know also have lot of requirement of uh, ai being used in many of the applications you know because uh, like you know power uh, cooling filters power consumption that means not only for information there are many other uh, you know uh, 
areas you know where ai can optimize and monitor many of the uh, essential uh, processes now traditional network security only is uh, dependent on uh, you know time consuming aspects like security policies and uh, uh, network uh, topography now you know this uh, policy designing has become a problem for uh, big networks okay and uh, vast number of networks similarly you know this uh, uh, ai can improve network security by studying network traffic pattern in you know, a widely connected uh, you know by uh, distributed networks now you know there are some disadvantages and weaknesses of using uh, ai as well for example you need enormous amount of uh, resources that is computing power is required and uh, sometimes you know ai systems might be educated by uh, data sets these data sets i was telling you know poisoning and other things you know so they can they can have different malware codes and uh, uh, some uh, anomalous data sets okay so that means you know the accuracy of data set is very important in uh, this and then hackers also can use ai themselves you know by the this dot search with you know adversary well ai is that so hackers also can use ai themselves and uh, they are continuously improving and refining their malware uh, so that it becomes uh, ai proof so that is uh, that is also there then uh, some of the desirable features of ai you see what is happening is most of the ai algorithms are uh, that is you know simply buy from somebody and then uh, it gives some results but we may not be knowing uh, what actually uh, how that particular result has come that means suppose you have got a uh, deep learning network no 10 layer network uh, suppose it gives some results uh, you know you should be able to actually uh, this uh, go into uh, each output of each layer and you should be able to say i think here there is some mistake so that that may be very difficult because you know uh, of the complex of the problem so uh, that is the problem that means as a black box we are having Uh, this uh, information, but uh, uh, internal information are there. So that's why you know what they call as explainable AI is required. Explainable means uh, whatever results it gives, uh, we should be able to trace and say yes, uh, this is really uh, true because of uh, this particular data being wrong or something like that. Okay. So similarly, it should be controllable. That means uh, the analyst should have uh, you know flexibility to edit. what ai suggests that means should not simply believe uh, that's what i told you know that means maybe you know 40 60% should be there that means ai can be used for 60% of the decisions 40% should be under the uh, analyst security analyst control okay so the blind blindly believe the ai and it should be adaptable that means it will continuously uh, it will uh, react to the security analyst feedback that is you know, uh, system will give some information security analyst will check whether it is really correct or not then he will try to uh, you know adapt the algorithms to uh, this uh, remove those uh, certain uh, problems okay and then you know of course alerts are required to say this uh, some uncommon things has occurred in this uh, ai calculations you know then it should uh, say that there is some uh, anomalous behavior okay so these are all the desirable uh, features now there are some uh, you know wise statements made by experts like when bruce sinner is one of the uh, security expert and you can see his uh, sneers blogs are there in his own website you know so uh, what he says is uh, this uh, there are uh, two jobs uh, that is there are two types you know one some jobs can be done by humans very well because you know human being is very creative very analytical as well as creative you know so uh this uh, some jobs computers do for example you know uh, this uh, getting a lot of amount of data going through that and coming to decisions and all computers can do but humans cannot do so computers excel at speed scale and scope okay and they can launch attacks in themselves in milliseconds and infect millions of computers uh, they can scan computer code uh, you know i just am reading because you know these are uh, very interesting observation by uh, one of the experts they can, can uh, scan computer code look for particular kinds of vulnerabilities and data packets to identify particular kinds of attacks uh, humans are excellent at thinking and reasoning okay they can look at the data distinguish a real attack from a false alarm okay so that's why you know 
the humans are creative and adaptive and can understand context also whereas computers are bad at what humans do well uh, computers are not creative or adaptive they don't understand uh, context they can behave irrationally because of those you must have seen the film robo by uh, rajini kant you know you can see it is a very typical uh, situation you know that is uh, context they may not understand so for example cynicism they may not understand emotion they may not understand okay so humans are slow and get bored at repetitive tasks so they terrible at big data analysis that's why you know uh, these uh, machines are very good at that so these are the basic differences you know that means you should have a a trade off between the usage of ai and uh, this one now there is another expert on uh, uh, side channel analysis and actually paul kosher so he has told uh, this you know uh, we see, wow, he was telling you know ai whether ai can be taught to understand uh, properties of software hardware design and tell us useful things about them okay whether uh, the design is one that might have certain categories of bugs in it okay uh, so he is telling there is an open question about how far ai can uh, go there okay the current ai applications tend to be ones where are where where you are optimizing some kind of set space okay uh, or have a relatively straight forward set of problems with very large amount of training data understanding complex logic uh, he opens doesn't fit very well uh, into that mold okay so that's what he is telling a lot of advances have to be made in ai you know Uh, to make it uh, still useful now you know this is the first introductory part now we will go to some of these uh, topics you know in fact that is this why don't to uh, deal with uh, uh, secure multi party computation okay that is uh, what is use of secure multi party computation for uh, uh, improving uh, security of ai systems now you know like one uh, new word that has come in uh, is uh, private ai private ai means uh, what happens is i told you, you know information is flowing from um, uh, various places you know for like data generators to uh, all these analyzing systems you know everything is going on now uh, in you know some media like internet or something like that so uh, they, there you know we have seen lot of attacks can be possible so uh, one simple solution is use encryption that means you know from uh, the place information is generated uh, to next place where it goes you have to put some encryption but encryption you know the problem is uh, you have to have key management that means uh, you should have some policies and uh, you know and uh, that is uh, and that key you know some uh, key management policy means like uh, you should use uh, oevo that is once and only once you have to use that key you should not repeat the key you should change the key frequently all many systems are there so machine learning encrypted data has become very important now that means it is desirable no doubt okay and then uh, any system we need data to be input to the algorithms uh, this data is coming through cloud uh, and then uh, through some agent and susceptible to be attack now how to protect this this already mentioned you, know, you can encrypt it. but then what they told is uh, once you encrypt you know obviously you have to decrypt at the next point so that again is the uh, problem so that means uh, their mutual privacy is not there that means you know, sometimes what happens is there is uh, mutual privacy may be required so that's why you know what they found is uh, can we do operations on encrypted data uh, in fact you know this has led to something called like homomorphic encryption that means uh, two persons can uh, send encrypted data and i can do something like that actually you know many tools have been built for uh, uh, this electronic markets like that that means you know some vendor supplies you know quotation for uh, apples another fellow gives for bananas uh, and uh, this that price you know encrypted form it will come uh, i am a, uh, i have to uh, quote a tender so i should be able to multiply uh this uh, so many quintals of apples 100 with 100 and then i have to multiply price of apples with uh, say 1000 then add that then i will uh, submit that means i don't know the individual price i don't i only but i should be able to do multiplication or addition operations on this information then only the final fellow uh, you know like uh, mbod or some other agency you know who wants this tender 
uh, that only he will be able to decrypt so that means you know you can uh, be very sure about uh, individual uh, privacy also this has led to the so called uh, homomorphic encryption and then here you can see you know the illustrative suppose uh, a and b information you have to uh, multiply okay i want the product you know what we can do is you can uh, encrypt a encrypt b then uh, this you should be able to multiply the uh, product then you should be able to get uh, any original value encrypted value of ab then you have to you, you will be able to decrypt you know so that somebody gets a, a and ab product will be there now this is actually you know possible using uh, rsa brother you, know, you see uh, this uh, For example, you see uh, RSA. If you are familiar with uh, this, you know, suppose I have got uh, E public key and uh, you know E encryption key and D is uh, other uh, counterpart. You know that E D is one mode N. So uh, this what I can do is because E everybody knows E and N are public parameters. So E sends U D power of M one mode N. B sends U D power of M two mode N. And uh, the receiver computes uh, C one uh, this uh, that is product of these two. To the power of d modern. So then, what happens? You will get m1 plus m2. So that means this is a additive uh, homomorphic system. Okay, but you know, basically, all Turing machines need two operations: one addition, one uh, multiplication. So multiplication can be done easily using L-gamal data. So that means you know what they do there is instead of message being put in the exponent, you message you put in the base. Okay, so that is L-gamal encryption. So now you know that means you have got both the Uh, these operations you can do addition and multiplication now with that you can do many operations okay so but you know of course uh, this uh, for example if you look at uh, machine learning uh, artificial intelligence operations you require you no know, there are many operations that have to be done uh, this sometimes you know logical operation that we are going to see shortly so even question has to be uh, the, those all those operations has to be done on uh, encrypted information so that is the basic uh, problem For example, homomorphic encryption, how many solutions are there, and even in this lattice-based, you know, ring learning with errors uh, can be used for uh, homomorphic encryption, and uh, somewhat homomorphic is there, and fully homomorphic also is there. Okay, so uh, now you know, I will just go through some of these uh, uh, tools that are developed because I am more interested in implementations. Okay, so in fact, you know, this uh, one I am going to discuss taken from. many of these uh, uh, published documents you know where they describe the full system development that means you know complete algorithms that are used for all that okay so microsoft has in fact developed uh, you know simple encrypted arithmetic library in 2018 itself that is you know, they have foreseen because of proliferation of uh, uh, cloud and all similarly you know there is something like encrypted sets that means uh, information in encrypted information is stored in the uh, this uh, all servers uh, i want to do sets now how i do uh, this if it is encrypted film you know how do i get that film so i want to subscribe you know, but i should know that that film is uh, where is that film i should know okay so for that you know they have given a uh, this uh, lot of importance because it has got lot of uh, uh, application now many applications in cloud are private storage and computation and uh, private uh, prediction services uh, hosted private training also then uh, uh, this uh, that means training for uh, you they will do they will do training for you private set intersection and uh, secure collaborative computation and microsoft has extensively used this uh, for password breach uh, detection this so called private uh, a Okay, then uh, this I will go a little. This is another tool, uh, you know, which is done by Facebook. So this is known as secure uh, multi-party computation uh, meets machine learning. That means, you know, actually uh, there is known as uh, something known as uh, you know, data mining itself. You know, uh, privacy was required. I was telling you about that uh, sale, sale of apples and bananas. You know, same thing. so many tools have been built actually like piccolo and all where you know uh, people like share market people have used that means you know uh, all transactions are using this uh, secure multi party computation 
for uh, uh, this uh, you know, share business as well as electronic markets. Okay. So, but now they are going to merge it with the machine learning. That is Facebook uh, research has done. So now uh, you train it uh, facilitates training of ML models on uh, private data sets owned by different parties. That means you know uh, these uh, data sets are private. That means uh, they are in a, in an encrypted form, or they are made to be encrypted and sent. Okay, so uh, like that, for different parties are having private data sets. Now I have to uh, train you know uh, on those encrypted information. Now this uses GPUs for computation, and then there is something known as the security against semi-honest corruption. You know, here semi-honest means uh, suppose you know this. Uh, basically, most of the systems are developed for uh, two parties or three parties. Suppose you know there are uh, three parties. You know, I can say semi-honest means they follow the rules. That is some policy they follow. They will not deviate from the policy. Okay, so whereas you know, uh, honest means uh, they can deviate from policy, but still we should be able to detect that uh, somebody has uh, at least two of them should say this. Uh, that is, you know, they are following the uh, policies. And now these are applicable three-party setting, and this uses you know a lot of uh, this particular tool. Description is available in uh, you know uh, full beautiful paper is there. Tensor computation. And uh, it uses, you know, two types of secret sharing. Normally, you must be aware of arithmetic uh, uh, secret sharing, you know, based on some its shared secret. Okay, so this uh, this uses binary secret sharing also. So here, you know, what happens is, uh, I think there is one more slide. You know, then uh, in fact, I was telling you, multiplication was a uh, problem. You know, for example, addition addition can be usually done by some its. Secret, uh, secret sharing. So multiplication was a problem. So the multi solution for multiplication was, uh, you know, invented as early as 1991 uh, by Beaver. Don Beaver, you know. So I am going to briefly discuss that. So uh, that means, you know, you can uh, multi-party computation can be done, multiplication can be done, addition can be done. Then obviously, you know, in uh, deep learning, we need lot of functions like uh, linear functions. Then non-linear functions. For example, you know, ReLU is a non-linear function that is a rectified linear unit. Then uh, dot products you have to do, matrices you have to solve, convolutions. Then non-linearity using sigmoid function. Then uh, uh, soft max, but max pooling. So exponentials you have to compare, uh, compute. Then comparison you have to do. So that means you know these are all the functions that are required in this. Uh, if you want to use uh, AI, okay. So all the specialized uh, functions need specialized primitives because you know these are the whole thing have to be worked on uh, this uh, shares only. That means uh, no information is available fully for anybody. Now you know for example arithmetic secret sharing means. Uh, Uh, the secret, you know, some X is there. Then uh, you know you you can refer to maybe people may be familiar, you know, some is share secret where uh, suppose there are uh, six people and three out of six you should want to say uh, some uh, correct information can be given. So you should construct a polynomial of uh, uh, second degree. Then uh, this uh, you know you can uh, yeah, that share value uh, that share uh, that secret, you know. Is uh, you put as the uh, zero to degree term, and then you choose some uh, random numbers. Then you compute the curve. Get uh, say three points and distribute to three parties. That is x value and the uh, function value. Then they can construct this. Uh, that is you know somebody uh, this uh, that uh, so if you give the three sets. Somebody will be able to construct the original X from that. So this is very very easily known. There is now today you know people use binary secret sharing also. Okay, so where you know the secret is in uh, where earlier one it was an integer form, where secret is in a binary form. So here you know the shares there it is not normal addition like previous one. It is exclusive var operation. Okay, so this also is provided by the Krypton uh, tool. Then uh, we might just briefly, you know, I will tell you about secure multiplication. This is one of the ingenious uh, ideas, you know. Uh, suppose I want to find uh, A multiplied with B. What is the result C? Okay. So they believe uh, they honestly they uh, rely on a trusted third party. So that fellow will give uh, this uh, A B C first. 
ए बी सी नो विच आर चोजन सच दट सी इज ए मल्टीप्लाइड बै बी ना सपोज वाट टू मल्टीप्लै एक्स एंड वै ए कंप्यूट एक्स मैन बिकाज नो दिस ए बी सी आर् अवेलेबल इन दर् आल द पार्टी ना ए कंप्यूट एक्स मैन ए बी कंप्यूट वै मैन बी ना एक्स प्रॉडक्ट वै यू नो यू हेव टू यू कैन गेट बै यूज इन दिस आपरेशन दट मीन नो यू कैन यूज दट सी एंड यू हेव टू यूज दिस what ever you have received that uh, epsilon and delta and you can compute this you know this this is how you can get the result so that means you know medium only e and uh, delta are going but i am able to do the uh, this is one of the most ingenious ideas you know till now there is no other uh, uh, technique that is used for uh, secure multiplication so this you may have to do now the here uh, this uh, uh, attacks are done on this if you uh, use the same abc for all the transactions that means you, know, you should keep on generating different uh, random numbers you know a b and compute the product c and then that that means you, know, you should not keep it for a long time okay so these are some of the precautions that means everything will have some uh, side effect also now you know this is how krypton system is designed so uh, this uh, communicator system you know will uh, actually take data from the Uh, this uh, user and goes to that pytorch uh, uh, you know tensor and then he gives options for arithmetic secret share or binary secret share and then you know uh, this auto you know, this uh, uh, auto grade is automatic gradient computation and then uh, there is trusted party third party will provide the beaver triples for uh, uh, all the multiplication operation okay so this is how the complete uh, uh, hardware has to be Uh, our software has to be designed now you know he has given you routines actually for uh, uh, performing all the operations that is uh, how to do this uh, multiplication and all and lot of random uh, no, no no this numbers have to be needed for this so to have that random numbers you know what they say is they use aes with uh, uh, some nist recommended uh, rngs random number generators are there so those random number agent you have to use to generate those uh, required uh, random numbers you know which you keep on changing uh, time to time now you know this krypton uses uses a lot of uh, primitives that is you know for arithmetic secret sharing uh, addition he can do you can do multiplication and you know they can do uh, truncation also that means you know sometimes uh, you find the product you may have to reduce the precision to say uh, 6 to 16 bit words you multiply you got 32 bit word i want to uh, truncate the answer to 16 bit okay so this operation you can do similarly binary secret sharing you can do logical operation like xor and and uh, you know left shift or uh, right shift that means scaling by 2 or this so this operation can be done and uh, in between you know the systems may need to uh, go from one form to another that means you know from arithmetic form to binary form binary to depending on the convenience of uh, something and you know this uh, uh, these applications may need also something known as uh, uh, you know sampling that means you know i should be able to generate some uh, distributions which are required you know so these you can have bernoulli sampling or uh, gaussian sampling any all the samples you, know, you can uh, these primitives are available in krypton and it is given actually comparison of uh, uh, various that means you know is not the first one you know imagine there are some around 20 systems which have been developed over time okay and uh, this uh, they have been used but each is having some uh, features you know uh, some people have got uh, advantage of malicious uh, security and uh, some fellows cannot do multiplication the some fellows can do multiplication so like that you know uh, some cannot be used on gpus and then some uh, do not support training okay uh, so like and some are for specialized applications okay like you know uh, maybe image processing something like that now you know there is one more uh, in uh, machine learning that means why i am telling you special some special operations may be required uh, you know like uh, there is something on a reverse mode uh, automatic differentiation you know if you are aware with the relu Uh, this relu is a nonlinear uh, function you know it is like a, our rectifier what we call in electronics that means you know if the value is positive uh, it, uh, this uh, suppose you know modulus of x is x if the value is uh, negative 
input is negative, output is zero. So it is nothing like a half wave rectifier, you know. So uh, now, you know, suppose you, this computation you have to do, uh, that is x multiplied by plus sin x. So uh, what happens, you know, some of the tricks they are using is to reduce the uh, this uh, repeated operation, sequential operation. For example, you know, here normally, uh, suppose you want to find uh, next derivative of z, because, you know, all this uh, uh, backward, uh, uh, that is trained networks, you know, you find, you have to find out the uh, gradient. Then the gradient is used to change the, adopt the uh, tap weights or uh, coefficients. So, okay. So, how to find derivative fast? That is the question. So, that means we don't want to do two steps, like first computing, then finding the derivative. So, here, you know, this particular uh, feature, you know, it does in one, one step also. So, uh, this, you know, what it does is he uses uh, some uh, graph-based representation. For example, the same operation I have shown there, you know, first you multiply x into with y, then you get a. Then simultaneously x takes sign of x and you get b. Now, you know, you add this uh, x into that is a with b, you get the z. So, here what he does is, uh, he does in uh, this uh, some other form. Uh, so, okay, this is the input you give. So, you see, all these are in the form of uh, gradients only. And the last two steps will give you this uh, answer as well as the gradient. So, this, this is one of the important differences between uh, conventional uh, computations and uh, uh, this this one because you no know, derivative you can find out you know, like present value minus previous value all this you can do okay but this you know this use the, that second step is avoided using this so like this some special features are there then as I mentioned to you, you know ETSI has got uh, you know recommendation they have given uh, this you can refer to this you know uh, where they have focus on uh, this uh, ethics in uh, uh, this AI systems, integrity, confidence, availability, avoidance of attacks. So all these they have given guidelines actually. Because you know what happens now is many systems may be available, but somebody should be able to uh, evaluate. You know, uh, so further standardization is required. Now there is one more system I am going to deal with is Falcon. So here you know this another uh, beautiful uh, uh, honest majority maliciously secure framework for private deep learning and used for image classification actually. That means, you know, if there is some child exploited imagery, uh, it will uh, be, it is basically developed for that. And it also is two out of three party MPC and, uh, you know, they use some, uh, this, you know, uh, all the, the general uh, requirements, you know, the primitives have been developed like uh, batch normalization. Batch normalization means, you know, you have to compute the mean. Mean is simple operation, that is your addition, addition of all that. Okay, and divide by the number, number of items. Then variance is complicated. That means uh, squaring you have to do. Then uh, the difference is squaring. Squaring again is nothing but multiplication only. Okay, so this uh, al algorithms for batch normalization, you know, uh, has been done. This, unfortunately, what happens, normalization means uh, division operation is required. So this is another interesting uh, uh, operation, you know. That is, you know, suppose I want to find A by B. Uh, this uh, even normal computer arithmetic itself, uh, division is a very uh, difficult problem because people have found some SRT, uh, some uh, operation like Newton Raphson method, some things are there. So, this uh, here, you know, what it does is they use Newton Raphson method. It needs a lot of iterations. So, to just find 1 by B first. Then you multiply A with 1 by B, then you get uh, A by B. So, each, that means, you know, what, what I'm, why I'm telling all this is, uh, you should go down to each, uh, you know, details of each operation, what are the computations that are needed, and then uh, this design a solution for, for those things, okay? So, here, you know, both semi-honest and malicious photo cases can handle, and then uh, various, uh, you know, actors are there, like who is holding the data. And uh, first, so using that data, you know, you uh, train the servers, then afterwards, you know, any query can be given. That query will be answered by the uh, servers. And here also, you know, what it does is some of the uh, one special instruction, they have got wrap function. Wrap function means uh, we have, you know, for example, I added, uh, say, some two numbers, you know, there will be something like, uh, you know, carry. So many times, you know, in ReLU, you have to find the 
because sign i was telling you you know uh, if your number is there you know uh, if it is positive uh, i will say output is uh, same input if it is negative i want to say it is zero so for that that means you know msb i should be able to identify so there are this is known as uh, you know wrap function so this is also uh, they have provided now uh, you see division here you know they have given a interesting algorithm of course i could not understand you know so this uh, that is everything based on uh, shares only but all the steps are done on shares uh, so that you get the uh, final uh, result now similarly carnegie mellon has got uh, uh, you know something they named as robust and secure uh, ai and they have got one an initiative known as national ai engineering initiative and uh, which is robust against uh, Uh, model errors and uh, they claim it is robust against unmodeled uh, phenomena and they only coined this word something known as xca that is explainable uh, ai then uh, so you know this basic interesting problem is training data and uh, actual data may be real world data may be different so they address this uh, problem that means if uh, because most ai systems sometimes problem is new data if you give then uh, because it is trained on a particular uh, data set you know it may not give correct results so this they take care of then they have also got uh, redundancy and uh, they have also made it safe against uh, adversarial machine learning so what did it do it will uh, learn the wrong thing uh, do the wrong thing and reveal the wrong thing so this is the philosophy of uh, adversarial uh, machine learning now you know this uh, conclusion is uh, this uh, actually you know this private ai is the uh, this uh, outgrowth of previous uh, technologies which have developed earlier like you know privacy preserving data mining and uh, secure multi party computation okay and uh, in fact privacy preserving data mining is having many other problems you know like uh, uh, for example you know, i can find intersection of sets union of sets like the many jobs you know i can uh, this all this people have done Uh, work on that but very complicated you no know, like suppose i ask you uh, this uh, i have got some uh, some tables and chairs one uh, list is there lot books and all so suppose you have got only tables and chairs suppose i ask find out uh, this uh, what is common between us each item you have to encrypt and then compare okay because you know this uh, this uh, because you know it is a list it is a list so i would suppose first one is a table or chair i have to encrypt and send you also encrypt you have to compare these two so you know this uh, we don't want to encrypt that so we want to do in some other way so that you know, so this earlier this work has been done but now it is again being uh, extensively used and extension to more than three parties also is uh, to be developed that you know these are some of the because the complications involved you know this and then uh, you can refer those rep- uh, papers which i have suggested you know uh, this they, they have uh, performance they have reported on uh, several specific applications and then uh, they have also compared with uh, numerous solutions that are available so this is what i wanted to say if any questions are there i will uh, address thank you. thank you very much sir welcome uh, Uh, thank you very much sir uh, for covering a wide range of topics and introducing the current major crypto trends and uh, technology used in machine learning and also driving the importance for the trade off between the usage of ai and the threats it can possess uh, if security is not well understood uh, there is a, a question sir there yes. are uh, questions sir if uh, if you can take uh, the first question is by miss velam bus uh, Uh, sorry i'm really sorry miss vembo selvi uh, the question is uh, among the traditional uh, ai models like ml cnn rnn which can be used in cyber security domain especially for attack detection well you see they have used all uh, uh, types you know this for uh, example people have used support vector machines for some particular application okay so that is in fact one of the uh, things we have to address you know many times maybe trial and error only you have to do there is nothing like you know this particular medicine will work for this particular uh, case okay so this uh, there is nothing like you know generalized statement about what is particularly uh, applicable for that and in fact one of the basic points here is most of the algorithms are trained on 
very old data sets. You see, if you see a lot of papers, you know, they are using some data sets created uh, for Olympics in uh, somewhere, in Canada somewhere. So, the, a lot of things have changed, you know. In fact, many of them are not having updated, uh, up-to-date data sets also. So, in fact, in India, you know, that is one of the requirements. Can we create uh, data sets? We use, that is, you know, that uh, maybe certain or somebody has to give, you know, uh, recent attacks that have been done from that, you know, find out what are the... Uh, this you know, trojan some malwares and all that if they give you know then we can adapt okay so next one yes sir so thank you sir so the next question is by uh, swapna ma'am uh, so the question is on what parameters can we select the best machine learning or deep learning model for an attack detection i don't know No, best okay. uh, means uh, like this, you know, they say uh, this uh, some figures of merit are given by people, you know, like uh, false positives and all, you know, so that you can estimate and based on that you can uh, select maybe. And then similarly, maybe other performance parameters may be there, like, you know, what is the uh, time that is needed? What is the time that is needed, you know, because some systems may be very slow, some systems may be fast. So this, uh, that is all, because I am not very sure about it. Okay, so can we proceed to the next question? Uh, there is one more question. Uh, which parameter should we choose to develop for anomaly detection? What? Which parameter should we choose to develop for anomaly detection? No, no anomaly detection is you should have some uh, guidelines about what is normal behavior. Then, you know, you have to compare with that expected behavior. And then, you know, you can... Uh, you can, that is the only way you can detect anomalies. So uh, there is a last question, sir, again, uh, by Swapna, ma'am. There are many tools for collecting data for identifying attack platforms. Can we rely on one tool or combination of tools? And how strong should we depend on data generated by these tools? I don't know. No, no, data generated by tools, you know, how, uh, in fact, you know, that's why what people do actually is they mix the data actually. That means, you know, it is not just, even if somebody gives you some data, I have to, uh, you know, insert some other data also to that. And then we can see, because suppose, you know, this, uh, most of the system, they say, uh, this, uh, you know, you have to, uh, suppose, you know, I want to detect a virus. You should not only give this uh, bad data, you should give good data also. Good data and bad data and some proportion you have to give, then only you should uh, train the system. Then you know you can perhaps uh, find the problem. Okay, sir. So, uh, because of time constraints, we'll take one more last question. So, uh, sir, is it okay? Um, yes, yes. Yes, sir. So, um, homomorphic encryption, is a promising solution. So, Mr. Prashant is asking you, uh, could you comment on uh, its performance for no, no, per uh, private data? No, performance, you know, it like this. Uh, homomorphism using ring uh, uh, LW, you know, learning with errors has been done. But uh, you see, sometimes, you know, the popularity may not be there much because uh, the key sizes are very large. It is not like using AES or uh, this RSR, something like that. Okay, so most of the systems now which have been given for post-quantum cryptography values, you know, they need very huge uh, key sizes. Okay, and then uh, this uh, benchmarks also are given. That is, uh, what is the time that is taken for uh, each operation, you know, on uh, processors like uh, maybe, you know, risk, uh, uh, okay, processors like, like GPUs and all. And uh, so are, are some platforms like you know PCs and all. So they have all the based on all this they have uh, uh, compared. You know, okay. So benchmarks are available. So based on that, you know, you can perhaps evaluate. Okay. So uh, thank you once again, sir. Well, welcome. You have covered large ground uh, on uh, current major uh, security involved in ML and AI. 
thank you thank you once welcome. again sir. welcome welcome so moving on we have uh, six speakers remaining two speakers before lunch and four speakers post lunch so um, i i would like to repeat the announcement again if you have question queries please post them on the chat box they will be answered by the speaker post after the presentation so without uh, further delay i now take uh, the pleasure of introducing the next speaker of the day uh, professor chester ribero who is currently working as an associate professor at iit madras he completed his phd from iit kharagpur and uh, a postdoc from columbia university his research interests are in cryptography system security especially hardware and operating system security and uh, sets has been having continuous interaction with professor uh, especially in the hardware security domain so um, without further delay over to you sir uh, yeah so i hope i'm audible yes sir you're audible okay Uh, so let me also share my screen. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, for this invitation to give this talk. Uh, it's always a pleasure to actually uh, uh, work with sets and uh, also uh, attend and uh, give talks at these at the meet. at the workshops that are organized by sets um so uh, uh like uh, mentioned my area of expertise is mostly in uh, security uh, mostly focusing at the system and hardware security uh, the ai aspects are relatively new to me so uh, please excuse if i actually have to miss something okay so uh, the talk i'm going to do today is Uh, called fault attacks on neural networks uh, this is uh, a, a domain which has been growing in the last couple of years so probably the first paper uh, work or uh, in this direction came up uh, roughly around 6 to 7 years back and since then there has been a large activity uh, in a uh, large amount of work and research going on in this area so a uh, a uh, 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 so the theme of this is uh, neural networks and a quick introduction although many of you would know at the high level uh, what is uh, neural networks all about but uh, just to set the platform uh, so uh, at least uh, one major application of neural networks is an image classification where uh, there are two phases uh, during the first phase uh, the network is trained on particular images to recognize Uh, certain types of images right so this probably would be would uh, there would be a data set and uh, based on the data set the various uh, uh, attributes of the neural network would be tweaked uh, until uh, over a period of time the accuracy of uh, uh, identifying specific images would actually become uh, quite high so once this training is complete uh, then we go to a testing or inference stage where uh, the neural network would be then deployed and uh, any uh, image uh, which is uh, put uh, given as input to the neural neural network would then be uh, used to maybe detect or classify a part that particular image right so we are now very uh, uh, focused in this talk about faults that can cause the misclassification so what do i mean by this right so here for instance i have uh so here for instance i have uh, uh kamita bachan and the, uh, due to some reason uh, which are false which could be one or multiple false uh, it gets detected as say for instance aishwarya rai right so this is what we know uh, know as a call as a misclassification so notice that uh, misclassification can occur due to the limitations of the accuracy of the neural network so even a well trained neural network would not give you 100% accuracy but uh, maybe even 98 or 99% but uh, this is beyond that so what we are actually saying is that uh, we are given an image and there is some disturbance or perturbation is something about the neural network it could either be in the training uh, it could be at the image itself or it could be at the device which has taken that image 
or it could be in the neural network itself. And uh, 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 this has caused the misclassification. So for instance, uh, given a photo like this without any pulse would have given you something like say at least uh, say 90% uh, accuracy uh, in detection. But with the false, the accuracy drops uh, considerably. OK, so. Uh, what are these faults? We'll, we'll come to know a little bit ahead. So. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Right, so so the uh, so why is it important now, uh, especially when you're talking about images, uh, these could uh, be used for two reasons, such attack or the, such post fault based misclassification can actually be used for two reasons. The first is the aspect of impersonation. So what we mean by this is that uh, we have a, 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 an image and uh, due to the faults injected at possibly various stages uh, uh, in the neural network, uh, this gets uh, detected as something else, right? So this is known as the impersonation uh, uh, based attacks. The other alternative based attacks is called as dodging. So what we mean by this is that uh, we have an image which should have been detected correctly, but the classifier, uh, the neural network would end up detecting some other it as some other class, right? So as some other uh, uh, person. So for example, here impersonation is where you have say Amitabh Bachchan and uh, it gets detected as say Aishwarya Rai. So uh, this is an example of impersonation. While a dodging attack means we have Amitabh Bachchan, but the neural network is detecting it as anybody else except Amitabh Bachchan, right? So these are the two uh, very popular attacks that uh, uh, false have been used in the past, uh, at least suggested, uh, to actually create. Okay, so in this work, we are uh, going to talk about two types of, uh, uh, of uh, faults. One is faults at the image itself, right? And the second one is physical faults in the neural network. Now the attack requirement, uh, so the objective of the attacker is to somehow introduce faults either, uh, either at the neural network or at the image itself, and then cause the misclassification, right? The misclassification could either be the impersonation as we see over here, or it could be a dodging attack, as we as we explained. Now the re requirements for any of these attacks are twofold. First is uh, it should be physically realizable, right? So what do we mean by this? So uh, uh, so in theory, it's it's actually very easy to get these attacks to work, but in practice, we uh, so we should be able to uh, detect uh, create this attack under various forms of uh, various conditions, right? Um, uh, like uh, the change of appearance, whether the, the falls are actually practically realizable. So we will actually see uh, more details as we go ahead. Uh, the second requirement for all of these attacks is that it is inconspicuous. So what do I mean by this? So obviously we are actually creating falls in one of these things. Right, so maybe at the image or maybe at the neural network or something like that. And uh, uh, in this, these faults should not be observable to somebody else, right? Who is just observing this entire uh, classification going on. So for instance, let's say uh, there is a person who comes in front of a camera and uh, uh, the and uh, and the neural network, the, the camera has taken a photograph of this person and has sent it to the neural network uh, to do the classification. Uh, so a person who is actually standing close by and witnessing this entire process should not be able to detect that there is uh, uh, an attack that is actually going on. The attack could be impersonation or the dodging attack. OK, so let's look at uh, the. Um, Let's try to go more into detail about this kind of attack, right? So where we have an image uh, or a person who's actually come in front of a camera, uh, there's a, a video or a photograph that is taken, and uh, this is actually sent uh, to the neural network to perform uh, um, a classification, okay? So what we will try to do is first we'll actually model this entire scenario, right? So we have an image 
uh, let's call it X. And what the neural network does is uh, that it uh, it provides a set of probabilities which we denote as f of x, right? So essentially, there is a mapping from x uh, to a set of probabilities, right? So for example, uh, x could be one of these images. Notice that uh, uh, it is it it is all of Amitabh Bachchan, but uh, it could be different images, uh, different time, a different place, different settings, and so on. Uh, passed to, a, to the neural network and uh, f of x would then give you probability. So for instance, over here, there's a probability of uh, 0.75 uh, 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 that these images are belong to Amita Bachchan and uh, 0.15 and 0.1 corresponding to the other possible possibilities in this class. So how good a neural network is, is often determined by this uh, uh, measurement of correctness uh, known, known as the softmax loss. So it takes two parameters, the f of x, which is uh, the probabilities that we obtain, and of, uh, and the class c of x. Right. So a class over here, there are three classes. So uh, you can specify the class and then uh, compute this to give you a, a measure of the correctness. Right. So uh, here we see that uh, uh, a little more deeper into this equation, we see that a C of X is a class corresponding to X. Uh, H C or H C of X uh, is uh, essentially a one hot encoding of the class. For example, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 0, 1 bit is set. And uh, what we are doing is what essentially we are doing is we are actually taken, uh, taking the, uh, uh, the probability of correctness with respect to the other uh, probabilities that are actually obtained. Okay, so if we actually apply this uh, uh, and compute this softmax loss on the uh, on this data which we have obtained, uh, we actually see that, and and this is the generic thing that the correct typically uh, uh, the the correct predictions have the minimum value. So for instance, uh, here uh, because of the highest uh, probability for Amita Bachchan, uh, it also gets the uh, lowest value of softmax loss, right? So uh, lower the value of this uh, of this equation indicates a correct prediction. So what do we want to actually do now, right? So uh, we want to essentially be able to view these images, but we want to essentially uh, we we want the neural network to uh, misclassified, right? So, what does this mean? So, going up, so uh, we want to essentially take this image, modify a few pixels here and there, in such a way, in a, in very strategic locations, such that the neural network actually gives you some other result, right? Uh, this could be either impersonation or it could be dodging, right? So, uh, uh, if you want to formalize these imperson impersonation impersonation attacks. So uh, uh, so we need something like this. We need some X, Amita Bachchan, for instance, and uh, we need the neural network to classify it as something else, right? Not the uh, class belonging to Amita Bachchan. So for example, this class could be, let's say, Sachin Tendulkar or Aishwarya Rai, right? So we are fixing the target class. We want Amita Bachchan to be, uh, 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 to be classified as say Sachin Tendulkar and uh, uh, and uh, we and to achieve this we need to actually make some minor modifications uh, to the uh, input image that is X. So the way we formalize it is as follows. Right and this is given uh, by this e equation. So what we see is uh, and if I just compare it with uh, the previous one here we are comparing uh, we are computing the softmax loss f of x, that is the output of the neural network, and uh, for a given input x, and the class uh, c of x, right? So here, what on the other hand, we make slight modifications. So we want some modifications to the input x, and this modification should be given uh, by, uh, is given by r in such a way, such that uh, the neural network should, uh, uh, the neural network should essentially uh, classify this image X plus the R plus the modifications into the target class C of T. Okay, 
Now, uh, since we know that uh, uh, the correct predictions would provide us the lowest uh, softmax loss, so we want this entire thing to be minimized. So softmax loss should be minimum for some perturbation or some changes in uh, echo, uh, in in the input x, right? In such a way, so so, so that the uh, target class which we want gets the highest probability. So you want to um, uh, create an attack by which uh, Amitabh Bachchan is actually uh, classified as Sachin Tendulkar. So what you do is you take the image, make some modifications to the image, that is this R, in such a way that uh, the probability of uh, of the Sachin Tendulkar class is the maximum. Right. In addition to all of this, what we want is that this changes to the uh, to the original image, that is this plus R should be minimum. And therefore we actually have this additional term called argmin uh, R, right? So we want to minimize the changes in such a way that it uh, provides us maximum probability of obtaining a, a particular uh, target class. The other alternative, uh, the other attack is called the dodging attack. Here you see a similar kind of equation. Uh, but with a negative sum. So what do we want over here, right? So we want that uh, our input X, Amitabh Bachchan for instance, should be uh, classified as anything else, any of the other classes, except that of his own class, of, of the correct class, right? So what we are trying to do over here, right? So softmax loss, F of X plus R comma C of X, right? So we want to change the input uh, with uh, and uh, so that when you actually uh, when the neural network classifies it, the probability uh, uh, should be minimum, right? Uh, or uh, so so we are trying to optimize with respect. Uh, you notice the negative sign over here. So in other words, we want to essentially maximize the soft max loss. So mentioning at the uh, in the whole uh, like. Uh, like the entire thing is is the following, right? So we want to make minimum changes uh, to f of uh, to the input x, so that the softmax loss is max maximized when uh, for the particular class c of x. Okay. So here we see that we have two optimization functions depending on the type of attack that we are actually doing. So we can either uh, choose the imposition impersonation attack and maximize the probability of getting a target class or alternatively we can uh, do a dodging attack where we minimize the probability that the uh, input image is essentially classified correctly right and all of this we are uh, doing with minimum changes uh, to the input Im image that is r and and argmin which, uh, which we actually find here right so uh, 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 yeah, the, so I'm actually uh, talking about this particular paper over here. Um, this is the accessory to a crime uh, published in CCS 2016. And uh, what they have actually done is uh, they have solved this thing to identify what changes should be actually made uh, to uh, uh, to, an, uh, to a given image. In other words, what is the minimum R value to uh, given to a particular image? Uh, so that the uh, attacks can actually become successful. The solution is done using uh, a gradient descent. So this is possible because these are both uh, optimizations and actually uh, satisfy the various requirements for, for gradient descent. OK, so the, look at the, let's look at the first attacks. Right, so what we see over here is that uh, the first time they've the authors actually tried out this uh, attack, they, they have obtained 100 percent success both for the dodging attack as well as the impersonation attack. Now, um, at uh, the first glance, uh, you see these two images and you see that they are visually, they look kind of similar, right? So uh, the image of the left is the original image without any extra perturbations in the image or any, any faults added to the image. Uh, the image on the right is the modified image which can, uh, uh, which is classified incorrectly, that is, uh, when this is passed through uh, a neural network, you can achieve dodging. OK, but unfortunately, this is not sufficient. Now, the reason that this we, uh, this doesn't solve our entire entire problem is the fact 
that uh, the perturbations required. So if you look at the differences between these two images, uh, we see, and, and this is what is actually shown over here, we see that it is not always practical. So why is it not practical? So if you have a static image, let's say you have a, a JPG or a, a PDF image of uh, uh, something, then it is very practical and uh, you can actually make the modifications uh, that is uh, suggested uh, um, uh, so as to obtain the attack. But in practice, we have a scenario where we have an actual human being uh, in front of a camera and these modifications should be made to the human being itself, right? So in the form of some changes in the face of the of the human. And uh, now you see that it is not always possible. You look at, uh, look at this, you, you see that there are uh, certain very specific pixels that needs to be trans, uh, uh, needs to be modified in order to bring about the attack. So even though this these works with 100% uh, accuracy, uh, uh, the attacks actually work, both impersonation and the dodging attack work with 100% accuracy. These attacks are not practically realizable. So what we will next see is how to take this fundamental attack and make it more practical. Okay. So first of all, what we do realize is that uh, we have an uh, we have an original image. We need to make some modifications, some change in pixels or something uh, in order uh, to uh, bypass or uh, fool the neural network. So first of all, what we do is we, uh, in order to make the attack more practical, we limit what can be actually done, uh, uh, what perturbations or what changes can be actually done to the image, right? So for instance, uh, one way, uh, uh, which the author suggests is to actually use uh, facial accessory. So things like, uh, uh, for instance, they suggested making use of an eyeglass, creating the eyeglass in such a way that um, that all the changes to the image is actually restricted to the eyeglass itself and nowhere else in the page. So uh, from a more practical, why is this more practical? Uh, for two reasons. First, uh, uh, you can just take a person, uh, the subject whom you want to actually dodge or impersonate or whatever, and uh, you just wear the eyeglass. Uh, now the eyeglass will, is sufficient, is designed in a way, and is, is sufficient to actually fool the neural network. So uh, the first point is that this technique, uh, just modifying or restricting all the changes to just one portion or by in, into one accessory is easily is implemented. And second, uh, the, uh, wearing an eyeglass, uh, is is very common. So there are many people who actually wear eyeglasses. So even if there is a stand uh, person standing by close by watching this entire activity, it is not very easy for him to identify that an attack is uh, actually going on. Right. Um, so in other words, uh, using or utilizing facial accessories is quite inconspicuous. So this is one requirement. The second requirement that we want is that uh, we want to enhance the uh, robustness of the perturbations. The perturbations are the modifications that we are uh, doing to, to the images, right? So, so what does this mean, right? So very often, and if you look at uh, the original equation that we have over here, we are taking one image X, modifying that image uh, with this plus R, in such a way that uh, the impersonation attack works and this image X is classified as uh, or into a target class. But this is not sufficient. Why is it not sufficient? Because we want every uh, image of that person uh, to be detected as, uh, to be detected as uh, somebody else, right, of the target class. So what we do is that we are not happy with just doing for one image, we will have to learn what is the best R such that uh, it would work for a large number of images. So we, we take this original image uh, equation that we see where we are identifying the minimum R to cause a uh, impersonation attack. We are modifying this, e uh, this equation in such a way uh, so that the, uh, uh, we, what we see is that we have added a summation over here. So this essentially means that we are uh, wanting uh, the R to be in such a way so that the attack works over a 
a large number of these uh, images. So you, we have in this case four images and the attack should work for all of those images, right? And not just one. And uh, that's the reason for the summation. So making it practical, not just requires that you localize where you're making the changes, but also ensure that even with the uh, change in behavior, change in facial expression or whatever, the attack should still work. Okay, the third requirement is uh, about the changes that are made uh, to the uh, uh, to the image. Now, uh, there. Uh, now, if you just look at a like a randomly generated computer image, most often you will see very sharp colors. So, what I mean by this is that there would be a red, and immediately the next pixel would be blue. In one pixel or ten pixels later, it would change to yellow. The colors are uh, the the changes within colors are actually very very sharp. And this is not what is typically found in nature. So in nature and uh, uh, when you take photographs or uh, the change in colors are typically very gradual. So as you see over here, there'll be very gradual and smooth change in colors. So what we want is that this R, which is meant for at a per pixel uh, here, is not uh, does not change very abruptly from one pixel to another. OK, so in order to quantify this or in order to um, Formalize this requirement. Uh, we have this uh, expression over here. Uh, what it uh, at a very high level, what it's doing is that for every pixel uh, in the picture uh, that is represented by R I J, that is the uh, uh, pixel at the I R uh, I comma J location. You look at the adjacent pixels, I plus one comma J and I J plus one. So the adjacent pixels, uh, pixel for the uh, the left and the right pixel, for instance. And you want to uh, essentially ensure that the, the changes in these adjacent pixel, pixels are uh, minimized. So you notice uh, this is a Euclidean distance. So over all the possible pixels, uh, the you want the R values, uh, R value differences with respect to the adjacent pixels to be actually minimized. Okay, so this would actually give you a very smooth flow. Uh, in the changes that you are actually making. Finally, in order to make it practical, is that uh, we need to change the image that we know. And uh, the changing the image essentially boils down to changing the uh, colors of the pixel. And colors of the pixels are represented by the uh, uh, triplet R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. right? And uh, a typical computer, uh, if you consider eight, bit for red, blue and green. So there are two part 24 possible colors that can be generated. However, uh, when you look at any printer, right? So uh, any mechanism to actually print these colors, there are far fewer colors that can be printed. So a typical color printer could, for instance, just print around 16 to uh, some of them could print 64 colors. And as you uh, increase the number of colors that a printer can support, you also are going to um, uh, increase the cost of the printer, right? So more expensive printers could support more colors. Uh, more cheaper printers, like a typical inkjet printer, which we use uh, at homes and office, um, uh, that would support a very small number of colors, maybe 16, maximum 32 or 64. So what we want is that whatever changes that we are making to the uh, to the image should be printable, right? And the way we actually formalize this is by this non printability score or the NPS, right? So we want that uh, the change, the, the uh, RGB values, the color that is actually used is very close to the um, colors that can be supported by a printer. So here we have uh, the set, this capital T over here is the set of uh, printable co uh, colors and the color which of the pixel should be very close uh, yeah, color of the pixel after the change should be very close to the uh, one of uh, to the supported uh, colors that can be printed. OK, so now uh, we want uh, we have. Uh, so this is what we are. Uh, uh, we, we want to target to essentially take this attack, uh, which was working with 100% accuracy, but uh, in practice not feasible. We we kind of have these four extra requirements to limit what can be done to make it more robust, to add smoothness, and to also make it more uh, uh, printable 
So we we want to optimize these three things in particular, right? So that the net result, uh, the net perturbations that you want, the net values of these R's that you want, should be more practical. So what we are now doing is that we 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 take our softmax loss function and incorporate all of these additional features, right? So you see that the original one is here. Uh, we want to support uh, multiple images, not just one X. So we incorporate the summation here. We have the uh, printability score, uh, which is incorporated over here. And again, it depends on the value of R. And uh, we also have this TV over here to en ensure the corresponding smoothness. So uh, in addition, we add this uh, uh, two constants, kappa one and kappa two, so, so as to balance and optimize among the various attributes. So this is a final thing. To perform our attack, uh, we need to now find the R uh, uh, the minimum R that can actually satisfy this equation or the, or the most optimized R uh, for this optimization function. Okay, so uh, this is how we are uh, obtained. And uh, I did mention that uh, just to recollect again that all this is essentially limited to changes in the glass frame, right? So the net result is something like this. So we have the original glass frame. We've added uh, all the perturbations to this particular glass frame, and uh, we have essentially a glass frame like this. So how is this glass? How is this obtained? So essentially, the uh, authors have uh, uh, created these values of R, right? Which, uh, which are of course restricted to this, uh, to this, uh, to this region of the glass frame. And uh, they have essentially printed it using a regular inkjet printer and uh, on, on paper and essentially print, uh, pasted it on the uh, glass frame. So the agenda is that any person who is uh, who wants to or the subject of the attack who wants to essentially impersonate somebody else or dodge the neural network would essentially wear these glasses with these with this colors print stuck on and uh, the attack would work with high uh, with a high level of uh, accuracy, as we'll just see. So, just a quick uh, thing about uh, how the authors um, uh, went about the experiment. So, they uh, tried three data sets. Uh, the first one uh, was a very large uh, data set, which was essentially downloaded uh, from this thing, 2015 paper. Uh, so, it had over 2.4 million uh, images. And uh, uh, this was over 2000 for of over 2000 uh, different celebrities, right? So each celebrity had a large number of images. So uh, the DNA essentially learned to recognize all the celebrities from this large set of millions of images. However, uh, since this was a uh, the data set was already given to them and this was a public publicly available data set, uh, this was not sufficient because they wanted uh, people to achieve uh, uh, essentially to modify what the people are doing, for instance, wear the glasses and so on. So therefore, what they have done is that in addition to this, they've also created two other uh, 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 data sets, one and trained corresponding neural networks. So DNNB, for instance, and DNNC uh, were created. DNNB essentially had 10 subjects, five people from the author's lab and five celebrities. So the advantage of this is since they are from the author's lab, uh, so uh, uh, the, tr the training and then wearing of the glasses can be easily done. Or DNNC on the other hand was a, a bit more complex and bit more a larger set to just to push the, uh, to see how far this can go. So they had 140 celebrities and three people from the author's lab. Okay, so these were the uh, data sets and the type of DNNs that they actually started with in order to test out these two attacks. So we'll first see the uh, dodging attacks. So uh, recollect that dodging means that we want to uh, be able to, uh, uh, that one person uh, should not be classified correctly, but can be classified as anybody else, right? So here are two of the authors. Uh, they are known as subjects. In fact, uh, uh, three of the subjects, right? So. Uh, there were three main authors of the paper, so they were called themselves that SA, SB, and SC. That is first, second, and third author. And uh, 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 I think these were these are the two. Uh, so this is the first author, and this is the second author. Um, or rather, I think this is the third author and the second author. 
so uh, so uh, they were essentially uh, uh, subjects uh, you notice that these glasses are specially designed for them uh, uh, considering uh, their facial features and so on in a way to actually uh, support the dodging attacks right so here for instance uh, if i consider this uh, sa that is this person uh, with a, a success rate of 100% that every time he wears the glasses uh, uh, the uh, the probability uh, the, the success rate of the attack that uh, the neural network would misclassify would actually uh, would mis uh, the neural network would actually misclassify with the probability of one that is every time it will actually go about and misclassify right uh, similarly for sb as well so we see that uh, close to 100 uh, sb is uh, this author the second author we see with the uh, with the success has a success rate of dodging to be equal to 97.22% very close to 100 right the third author on the other hand uh, that is sc rather the first author over here the sc has a success rate of 80% which is considerably lower now one reason for this is uh, perhaps uh, s as the authors mentioned, I was the only one who actually wore uh, glasses uh, by default, and uh, therefore uh, this could be a disturbance in uh, uh, whatever modifications or whatever uh, was uh, perturbations that were created on those glasses. So even though the success rate is high at 80%, uh, the um, the uh, uh, it's not as high as the other two. At least in this experiment. So uh, here you also see that uh, what is the expected probability of the correct class. So you see it's pretty low, except for the th this subject SC, which is at 0.35. So prior to wearing the glasses, each of these was at least 0.85. And with the wearing of the glasses and uh, with the perturbations and faults that were introduced, this uh, reduced to much lower as we see over here. Okay, so this is about the dodging attacks. Similarly, there were also impersonation attacks as well. Okay, so for the impersonation attacks, so the uh, thing is that we have a uh, we have a subject which again is S A S B and S C, uh, which is again S A S B and S C, the three authors over here, and uh, we have uh, targets which they want to impersonate. So for example, uh, the, uh, the third author, uh, which was this, uh, wants to impersonate this celebrity, which is Mila Jovovich. The second author wants to, uh, uh, wants to impersonate SC, which is uh, here, the first author. And uh, this is the, uh, the first author who wants to uh, impersonate Clive Owen. So again, we see that uh, the um, success rates are uh, are considerably high. Okay, so uh, this was one attack. Of course, there uh, this was a CCS 2016 paper, and uh, following this, there were several other attacks as well. Now we'll look at an other form of attack. Uh, here uh, we are now introducing the falls in the neural network itself, right? So we want to still be able to do do dodging and impersonation, although uh, in this particular case we'll be mostly focusing on impersonation attacks, and uh, but the falls are not introduced uh, in the image, but rather in the neural network itself. So what do we mean by this, right? So the, eventually at the end of the day, the neural network is uh, essentially a piece of software which is running on a, a processor, right? So this may be a dedicated uh, neural network accelerator, or it could be a general purpose uh, processor, or it could be a GPU, right? So what we do uh, uh, in, this, in this form of attack is we disturb the computation of this uh, of this processor. How do we disturb it? We'll actually uh, see in the next slide. But the idea is that as the neural network software is, or library is, is executing, we make some changes or some, we introduce some faults in such a way, uh, in a very precise way, such that the desired attack can be achieved. Okay, so the question now comes as to how uh, we create these faults. And uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, this, uh, entire work is taken from this uh, paper fault injection on deep neural networks uh, published in ICAD 2017. Okay, so uh, many different ways are uh, present uh, to inject these faults. Uh, some 
uh, like the row hammer, make use of um, fundamental properties in the uh, physical properties of memories. For instance, what has been shown is that uh, if you take the DRAM, uh, the dynamic RAM, which is typically used in uh, computer systems, and uh, if you keep accessing, uh, at least there is an algorithm where you keep accessing some component of uh, some portion of the RAM, then uh, uh, locations or memory cells adjacent to that particular region which has been accessed, there is a high probability that, or there is some probability that these toggle by itself, right? So for instance, uh, I am uh, I, I define a program, I introduce a, an array, and I keep accessing that array multiple times at a very high speed and ensure that uh, the contents of that variable in the DRAM is actually changing at a very fast rate. Now, due to the physical properties of the DRAM, what people have shown is that adjacent uh, rows, rows which are uh, memory cells which are actually close to this variable, uh, there is some chance or some probability that uh, this data can actually topple. So this was first discovered in uh, in 2015 by Google, and since then they, it has been tested and shown to work on a, a large number of DRAMs, including uh, DDR2 and DDR3. Uh, to some uh, extent, it also works on DDR4 as well. The second way, which is uh, uh, of injecting faults, is by this laser fault injection. So here, of course, uh, uh, this is a much more. Uh, uh, this is of course a free technique is a completely software based approach and therefore you just need to run a program to inject the faults. However, the controllability of the faults is actually limited. So what I mean by this is that uh, finally the possibility of injecting a fault is uh, randomized. Uh, it's based on a on the physical properties and that there is a prob probability uh, involved with that your fault injection is successful. OK, laser fault, on the other hand, we see that there's a laser over here and you uh, put your you 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 mount your processor just below it and at the right time and the right spot you inject, uh, you fire the laser. The laser goes and uh, strikes a particular memory cell, maybe a, a DRAM or an SRAM or a register or so on and essentially toggle the contents of that memory cell. The third way, which is uh, 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 not as powerful as the laser, but uh, much more power, but uh, uh, like more power, definitely more powerful than row hammer, is by introducing glitches in the clock or power lines. So what is a glitch? A glitch is a spike in the power supply. So you have uh, some hardware which is actually performing your neural network uh, uh, computation. It may be a GPU or embedded processor or anything. Just at the right instant, you introduce a glitch in the power supply. Right? And this glitch could eventually go and modify some uh, data which is stored in memory or registers. The net result of these faults, whether uh, it is laser fault injection, row hammer, or by glitches, is that some bits in registers would actually toggle. So here you see that this was the original register contents. After injecting the fault, you have seen, you see that there are two bits that have actually toggled. This one has turned to zero, and this zero has turned to one. So what is the net effect of these faults is that uh, in memory, if these faults are injected, uh, then uh, you the data which is stored in memory could uh, could essentially change, right, uh, due to the fault injected. Or if you're looking at instructions or the program counter, then the uh, the, the the instruction opcode or the instruction itself can actually change. So here you see that uh, there was uh, you, the original instruction was out R9 comma R0. Due to the injection of the fault, uh, out, it has changed to R9 comma R1, right? So actually speaking, there is just one bit of uh, fault that has been injected into an instruction. Another uh, good uh, popular thing that can happen to a fault is that it could cause some instructions to be skipped. So uh, the way to actually go about this is to cause the fault to be injected in the program counter. So as the program counter, you know, keeps incrementing, uh, a fault injected would essentially uh, increment the program counter, skipping an instruction, right? So you just say inject a fault so that it just skips the one instruction and actually, uh, and this could re result in a um, uh, in a fault. So how is all this false applicable uh, to a neural network? Let's look at, at that. Uh, 
right? So a typical neural network looks something like this. Uh, it has an input layer, it has uh, multiple hidden layers, and then you have an output layer. And then as we've seen, uh, there are a set of probabilities that you obtain over here. Then there is uh, softmax, which would eventually uh, identify and classify the, uh, the image for you, right? Now each of these uh, nodes in the neural network is essentially a neuron, which looks something like this. So a neuron uh, we see over here, this is this neuron which we see over here. Uh, it has multiple inputs. All of these inputs are either uh, from uh, the input of the image itself or from a previous layer. So it's labeled as X1 to Xn. They are weighted uh, W1, W2 to Wn. There is a bias that gets added and uh, the net result is then passed through some activation function. In this case, it is uh, called GU. Right, so there are there are multiple possibilities for this activation function. Here uh, uh, we are using the activation function called ray loop, which is max of zero comma u. Right. So now, what do you imply by uh, fault injection in such a neural network? So first of all, notice that uh, this neural network would eventually be executing in some device, GPU or CPU or uh, hardware accelerator. Injecting a fault essentially means that we are changing uh, either the bias or the weights or some computation uh, in one of these neurons, right? Now, when this, uh, when we perturb or when we introduce this particular fault, it essentially disturbs the output and changes the output. Now, this output uh, of this neuron is now faulty, right? And uh, it now propagates to the remaining part of the uh, of the network. And then uh, it would possibly change the probabilities. So changing the probabilities will eventually, if it's if the fault is injected in the right way and at the right time, it can essentially cause the um, uh, 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 in this particular case cause a uh, impersonator attack, right? So the objective now is that we have a neural network running on a device. We want to inject a fault in such a way so that uh, the attack works. And making the attack works means just that we are we should be able to change these values of Z1 and Z2 uh, so that the soft max uh, identifies the wrong uh, classifies this particular image in the wrong way, right? So notice that in over here the correct is like this. So we have a high probability uh, of uh, Amitabh Bachchan, uh, and then injecting the fault actually toggles the, or changes the probability so that uh, the classification is now incorrect. So when you're looking at uh, fault attacks on the devices, very much similarly to the other case, there are certain criteria, right? And in this case, there are two uh, criteria. One is the aspect of efficiency and the other one is the stealthiness. So what do we mean by efficiency? We need to inject a fault in such a way so that um, the attack works with a high probability, right? And uh, as we see over here, there are multiple different ways of actually injecting the faults. Now, how do we quantify the fault? Essentially, let's talk about the fault in uh, uh, in the bias. So we are injecting a fault over here, which essentially is changing the bias W0 to something else, say W0 prime, right? So the amount of change required uh, is essentially quantified in this graph. So here on the x-axis, we see the various layers from uh, close to the uh, input layer to close to the output layer and uh, 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 the y-axis, the blue graphs show how much of change is required on the bias to bring about an impersonation attack. So as we see that uh, as we go towards the output layer, the amount of change or the delta changes required uh, in the bias in these various neurons uh, becomes very less, so just 19.53. Okay, and this essentially uh, brings out the attack uh, with an accuracy of, uh, of as we see over here. On the other hand, if we go towards the input layer and try to inject the faults, then we require more uh, uh, more changes in the bias. So uh, we need to change the bias by a larger amount so as to get about a successful fault. The other aspect that we uh, uh, is required in such fault attacks is the aspect of stealthiness, right? So uh, injecting faults, as uh, one would uh, have guessed by now, uh, it, it requires these very powerful equipment like a laser or things like that, 
or it uh, it requires these properties like row hammer which is not very uh, easy to control right and therefore we want to essentially minimize the number of uh, faults that should be injected in order to create a successful attack so in other words we, uh, stealthiness is the need to make minimal changes in the neural network in order to achieve the desired impersonation okay so uh, can how do we actually bring about this so uh, uh, so we we will uh, essentially look at uh, this so let's consider this as the equation so here we have the neural uh, the function f uh, which has uh, takes an image x1 and theta here is the state of the neural network it corresponds to all the biases uh, in various neurons it corresponds to all the weights and so on right and uh, the result is that uh, we get y1 which is the output of a prob some probability class okay so now we want to essentially create a fault right and the way we are bringing out a fault in this example is by modifying either the bias or the weights uh, which is present so we want to bring about a change in theta uh, such that a theta changes to theta prime due to the fault and the result of that is uh, the computation of the neural network would actually classify y1 to some other class y2 right so the way we want to optimize it in order to achieve stealthiness is that this change from y1 to y2 uh, should be with uh, should be with minimum number of faults with with the uh, by minimizing the number of faults so what we want to do is we want to increase this probability uh, y2 so that uh, the neural network then uh, classifies to this uh, class y2 while at the same time we want to essentially reduce the uh, difference between theta and theta prime so this means that we want to uh, cause as small changes to the neural network as possible in order to maximize the uh, chance of an impersonation attack so here impersonation means we want to force that the image input x1 uh, is getting uh, uh, classified as uh, some y2 class right and therefore we want to increase the probability of y2 okay so uh, again this was actually uh, uh, solved. So this is again an optimization problem uh, solved using a gradient descent. Uh, the author shows some optimizations, further optimizations and uh, assumptions which they make and uh, which could actually improve this kind of uh, the results. So here uh, is the final result. So what we see on each row is the uh, various layers, layer two to layer eight. Uh, these are the inner layers and uh, we uh, essentially look at the accuracy of a successful attack on two uh, data set MNIST and CPAR uh, and uh, MP here is the number of modifications required right so uh, what we see uh, is that with an accuracy of let's say uh, in layer two with an ac accuracy of 59 percent and 200 changes in uh, uh, in this layer two we have been able to actually create the attack on the other hand uh, with layer eight uh, the accuracy is essentially much more higher, right? So we are getting like uh, almost 95% to 96% with the with the uh, with the mod with with the uh, MC the modi modification compression. So uh, uh, another optimization which was suggested. Uh, the changes are 14 uh, 1439, right? So the attack is successful with a far more accuracy uh, compared to uh, closer to the outer layers compared to the inner layer. Okay, so uh, so this actually shows two of the different types of ways you can actually inject faults in the uh, either the image or during the computation itself in the neural network. But uh, what people have shown, uh, and there are papers which have not covered as yet, is that these faults can also be introduced in various other places as well. So, for instance, uh, you could introduce faults in the training during the training phase, right? So that you train the model itself, the malicious, uh, the attacker, somehow has access to the uh, training phase and the da training data sets, and, and is able to tweak the data sets itself so that, uh, and introduce faults during the training itself so that uh, Amitabh Bachchan gets classified as Aishwai Rai. So nothing else is required, no other changes is required. The alternate approach is uh, at the camera uh, uh, input device itself. So here what we see is that, um, uh, the input, uh, the, the camera takes a photograph 
and uh, this photograph is processed. Uh, there are multiple layers of uh, processing which actually go on. Now, if one of these uh, layers is malicious and a fault is uh, injected, then it would also bring about the same effect of the attack. So here, of course, the threat vector in each of these case, this is, cases are different. So here, for instance, we have a threat vector where uh, the person itself is able to change his appearance and so on, uh, and uh, therefore bring about the impersonation. Here, uh, it is more of a hardware or firmware security uh, aspect where the, there is a Trojan or a backdoor or a malware present within the camera software, which can introduce modifications and slight uh, variations in what gets stored of the image and bring about the same form of attack. Uh, uh, the neural network uh, now uh, is a more on-field thing and more focused on IoT devices where a person can, uh, attacker can get hold of a, of a device and is able to uh, uh, like force a fault and a, a wrong output uh, from the neural network during the computation. The, th the fourth type of attacker is at the training. So this we this is a an example could be an insider attack attack. So let's say we have an organization where it is uh, training this neural network, and we have an insider uh, person working in the organization who is malicious. So he can bring out some minor changes in the in the way training is occurring, so as so that when deployed, uh, this uh, attack actually works. Right, the both the impersonation or the dodging attack would work. So uh, this is a very interesting area of work. A uh, lot of uh, uh, at the intersection of both AI as well as uh, uh, cyber security. A lot of open research problems uh, are present. Uh, I come from the cryptography and security perspective. Uh, the AI thing is new for me. From a cryptography uh, perspective, there are there, there's been like 50, 60 years of uh, mathematical analysis to prove uh, security or to detect, uh, to analyze and quantify the security of the systems. So hopefully, uh, on the other hand, uh, such security, uh, such uh, evaluation and uh, formal techniques on uh, for neural networks is uh, not yet arrived mainly because um, uh, mainly because uh, this is a very new field right N not more than like six or seven years or so right so uh, one objective uh, uh, so so it's it's got a very rich set of uh, research problems uh, if at least from what i see it if we can actually adopt uh, cryptographic the, the things we know about cryptography to the machine learning so uh, uh, we, we've just recently started working on this and as we progress itself, we see uh, two things. We see both the uh, the similarities with the crypto world as well as we see the dissimilarities, right? Um, so uh, just to give a, like for those of you who work on crypto and uh, uh, in crypto for us, everything is uh, about the secret key. So we want to protect the secret key and everything uh, is based on that. But here, on the other hand, there are many things you, that you want to protect, right? So there is nothing secret per se, but uh, you, you may want to protect the model uh, or what the model computes. So the agenda is different, but uh, uh, there are also a lot of similarities as, as well, right? So we are uh, currently, yeah, so I've also listed something, but it is more about uh, what I just mentioned. So uh, yeah, so currently this is uh, our objective and uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks again for inviting me and also listening to the talk. And uh, possibly if there's any time, I could actually take a few questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative presentation, sir. So we are actually running out of time. So um, I'll probably uh, uh, ask you two questions, sir. Remaining if you could answer in the chat box. Sure, uh, so yeah. The first question being uh, uh, by Miss Sam Samyukta. How do I escape a fault injection attack? And how do I make my neural network fault intolerant? Uh, sorry, fault tolerant from a developer's point of view. OK, so so that's a very good question. There's no solution uh, uh, per se as of now. Uh, so I can talk to you from the cryptographic world because uh, fault attacks in cryptography have been studied for almost uh, two decades now. And people know how to actually protect uh, crypto implementations, let's say of uh, ciphers, RSA or AES. Uh, uh, we know how to essentially protect these implementations from from fault attacks. 
right? So uh, techniques, uh, uh, some of the very popular techniques is that uh, you can add redundancy in your computation. So you know, for instance, that uh, uh, there is this small function which is very critical. If a fault is injected on this particular function, then it could uh, uh, lead to an attack. So uh, what you do is you could add redundancy or some kind of a parity check. So these would be able to detect if there's a, a fault that has been injected. Now a similar kind of approach could also be possible for neural networks as well. So though nobody, people have suggested in the papers, but nobody has actually quantified its uh, usefulness or effectiveness. And uh, that's also one thing we can actually think about. So uh, the next question is by Aarti. How do I identify the vulnerable parameters bit in the DNN? Um, uh, can you repeat that question? How do I identify the vulnerable parameter bit in the DNN? Oh, OK. Uh, so again, uh, OK, so if you uh, look at the particular paper at FSU, uh, uh, I can you can you can actually look up the paper. So so they have theory about how so it's not like randomly just saying that I will inject a fault over here, but there is also a theory uh, that is involved as to how best how to uh, identify the best uh, location to inject the fault and therefore also identify which are the most vulnerable neurons uh, within the neural uh, within the network. Sir, uh, okay. Because of lack of time, if you could answer the remaining questions in the chat box, there are chat box. There are quite yeah. a few questions. OK, sure, sure. I'll uh, I'll take it up. Uh, I'll, I'll take it up now. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you once again, sir, for your time. Thank so, you. Bye. so moving on to the next speaker for the day. Uh, I will now briefly introduce to our next speaker, Professor Richard Singh. Uh, Ma'am is currently working as head of department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering Department at Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur, and is an adjunct professor with IIIT Delhi and West Virginia University, USA. She is a fellow of IAPR and a senior member of IEEE and ACM. Uh, she was a recipient of the Kusum and Mohandas Pai Faculty Research Fellowship at the IIIT Delhi and the FAST Award by the uh, Department of Science and Technology, India. Uh, hello, ma'am. So uh, over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Great. And uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. The screen is also visible. OK, uh, just give me one second. I'll try to hide this. OK, all right. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to uh, discuss uh, to this audience here. Uh, my name, I li like uh, you already know, my name is Richa and uh, I'm a faculty at IIT Jodhpur. So today I'll be talking with you about misinformation in the visual world. Uh, this is something that I've been working on. My research group has been working on for last few years, uh, last seven, eight years, and uh, would like to share some of the interesting challenges uh, that this com that this community is facing and uh, how they become very applicable to uh, everyone who's facing uh, who's using machine learning algorithms for uh, different kinds of tasks even even as trivial as reading news or uh, face recognition or some or uh, some of these tasks, right? Some of the topics I was listening to the previous speaker as well, and some of the topics you might find a bit of overlap because, uh, uh, yeah, adversarial attacks and a bit of that. Uh, I'll I'll be talking about it uh, as well from probably a bit of a different context. So, all right. So let me let me start uh, the presentation. Um, so we know what is information, right? If I if I take a look at uh, the definition of information, it is essentially a knowledge that you get from someone or something, right? You could you could extract this information some from someone, from, from some object, from some information source, 
right? So it's a set of facts or details about a subject, about a place, about any object, about any event. All of these are information, right? So there are a lot of ways of gathering information. And uh, if I go back a few years, maybe a decade, two decades back, the traditional sources of information for public used to be professional journalists at well-established reputations and uh, newspapers, magazines, televisions, radio. These used to be our sources of information, right? There would be official records that are there. There would be uh, census surveys of the government from which we would get extract information and our, our uh, regular and on a daily basis, our sources used to be books, biographies, personal diaries of important personalities. The, the, these used to be some of our traditional and trusted sources of information for public, right? Today, what is happening is in modern days, those traditional sources are still there, right? We still have books, we still have those uh, news articles and, and uh, census and government reports. All of that are there, but there are a lot of new non-traditional sources that have come into the picture also, right? And these non-traditional sources are often referred to as citizen journalism or electronic media, new media, right? And there are a lot of ways of gathering this. It could be social media, it could be websites, it could be blogs. Many of them may be authenticated, many of them may not be authenticated, right? Um, many of them may be authored, many of them may be anonymous. So there, there are a lot of different ways of gathering these uh, information today in the non-traditional, the non-traditional ways of gathering this information, right? And they don't have to be approved. I can just, uh, I want to write something, I can tweet it. I can put up a post on Facebook, Instagram, anywhere, right? And, and it can be shared publicly. Uh, and th there's no stopping it from becoming viral as well. It could be a completely incorrect uh, news. It could be just something that I wanted to share. And um, uh, it can be shared, right? It could be a source of information for others. And many a times there is this WhatsApp as well that is used to share news, fake news, information. And we often call that WhatsApp university in uh, general conversations as well, right? So when people are consuming this information from different sources, many of them being non-traditional, non-trusted, right? Non-trusted, non-authenticated sources. So it's very important that one should have a mechanism to figure out if the source, if this information is correct or not. Is this information reliable or is this fake or not? Before I consume that information, trust that information, and as I start acting on it, I should have mechanisms to, to verify that, right? So uh, this is where your, uh, so misinformation uh, or fake news could be in a lot of different ways it, or a lot of different areas it could be there. It could be related to deception of personalities, it could be related to creating bias to change real world outcomes. It could be simple misinformation to the readers, or it could be just random uh, chat, ranting, any of those sort of things, right? For example, uh, uh, this there is this uh, website, right? The Onion, uh, there was this um, article on that. There was a, a post on that, that Elon Musk gives Saudi investors presentation on new ways of beheading machine for, for folks, right? So. Obviously, this is a fake news, right? Uh, so, but uh, it's there. It was shared by a lot of folks. A lot of people read it. It's up to us. With when these informations are shared in this manner, it is it is the the burden on evaluating or determining whether the news is fake or real lies on the consumer itself, the reader itself, right? Trump said at one point of time that um, America has not been stronger or more united since I first opened my eyes and created the universe. Obviously, it's not correct. Trump did not create the universe, right? But it can be misread and people, uh, people can create fake news about a lot of uh, different things like we discussed earlier. Right? When, when COVID started, there was this uh, WhatsApp messages that were floating around. Great news, coronavirus vaccine ready, and the name of the companies, millions of doses are already in place with such uh, realistic looking images of doses and vials and everything were circulated. Right? Uh, there was an office memorandum that was circulating uh, among the general public on uh, 
this is, date is 13th March 2020, right? And uh, of, of this office memorandum actually declared holiday from 14th to 21st of March. If you remember, the lockdown happened, I think, on 23rd or 24th of March, right? And 10 days before that, there was this uh, properly signed, uh, beautifully drafted uh, office memorandum was circulating that these four states have declared holidays, right? And then when people um, tried to investigate this a bit, they figured out it is fake news. Now, if you look at this, this office memorandum, it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to figure out that is this fake or is this real? It can be generated by uh, us as humans or today. It could also be generated. The technology is getting advanced to a state that you can generate very sophisticated misinformation automatically as well, right? What is the difference when it is generated automatically versus it is generated by humans? Automatically, uh, you can't match up the scale that you can generate uh, misinformation automatically, right? Uh, there could be a lot of different uh, kinds of information that can be generated automatically. So you understand the problem of uh, misinformation, fake news, and all of that, right? My particular research deals more in the visual world. I work a lot with images, and one of the very primary reasons is I really believe this saying of a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Uh, you can you can read a lot, uh, you can convey a lot of information from the pictures, right? So take a look at this picture here. What all do you see in this image? Uh, I would have ideally liked to be able to see the chat box so that you can tell me, but um, I don't have the chat box visible right now on the screen. But there are a lot of things, right? Uh, what comes to your mind? It's an amusement park, it's a sky, water, rides, right? So uh, there's so many different things that, sorry, there's so many different things that people can read up, can look or create a story. Right? The story, uh, if you were to explain this image to somebody and I were to explain this image to somebody uh, versus uh, so Mitran has to explain this image to somebody, our, our versions would be very, very different. Right? You might look at something based on your experiences versus me versus somebody else. So it can speak a thousand, uh, like I said, a thousand words. And if I want to alter any of these things, let's say instead of this Ferris wheel, I want to put up something else. Instead of the sky, can I put up a Los Angeles uh, backdrop at the back end? And this amusement park, I can change from wherever it is located to bring it to India, to take it to China or any of those places. That is, that is what is, we are able to do today, right? And uh, to show you an extent of misinformation where we can, what we can do, there was this very realistic video that was released. Take a look at the video. And if you remove the context from this, right? If you look at the context, who's dancing, you, you would realize this is not real, right? But forget the context, look at the quality of the video. Thus, from anywhere, it shows you uh, uh, noises or uh, inconsistencies in the video or from anywhere can you see that this video is not real leave out the context for now right so when as humans we know who the person in the video is right if we know we can associate the context but if it was some other person in the video whom we do not know if we do not understand what is the backdrop if we don't uh, if we don't uh, recognize the backdrop of the video how easy or difficult it would be for you to detect whether this is a fake video or it is a real video, right? And day by day, the fake news that we are getting is becoming more realistic. Take a look at this different uh, a combination of fake and real uh, images that are there on the slide, right? All of them are talking about President Obama and terrorism. The first one is, is a scraped fake news. It says Obama makes shocking remarks on terrorism. All right. The second one says Obama found to support terrorism. The third one is a, a real news. Uh, uh, a, yeah, so Obama gives a speech on terrorism. By combining all of those, the three different information, we could create a further realistic, a more detailed version of the news uh, 
which is which gives more information right and if it gives more information more details rather than just one one uh, one line title if it gives you more information it becomes a bit more realistic and and if the information doesn't look at the face of it that no this cannot happen right if it doesn't look at uh, like that uh, it becomes uh, more believable right so the challenge is today to take these into consideration and be able to predict whether uh, these are um, real or not take a look at this images uh, can somebody tell me who are these celebrities think about it can you can you map it with uh, any of the celebrities that you know again uh, if there are any responses can you tell me these are actually all non existing identities these are images generated by something called as generative adversarial networks right and uh, look at the quality and the details that are present in these images the intricacies that you can see the uh, the details it's it's uh, again it's difficult to understand and appreciate that these are non real individuals that these individuals do not exist right so these are different sources of uh, different ways of generating misinformation they, and uh, these are some of the ways that i have listed here uh, there are you could generate misinformation by physical alterations like uh, uh, the earlier speaker dr chester was talking about uh, you could use glasses or they could be physical attacks so there are physical alterations that can happen you can make digital perturbations in the image okay some of some of the uh, the video that i showed you right that video uh, shows uh, examples of digital perturbations there there are adversarial attacks that are possible and uh, generative adversarial networks face images that i showed you are here are example of generative adversarial networks and then there is something called as deep fakes right this is a more recent technology uh, which is gaining a lot of attention in popularity and effectiveness as well so these are some of the sources of generating misinformation and when we talk about being able to counter these we need to be able to counter all of them today right because all of them are getting very prevalent so to show you an example of physical attacks consider a face recognition system we're using face images uh, faces for uh, for a lot of different uh, applications today right for example um accessing your phone uh, in banks attendance lot of different ways so there are very standard and simple ways of attacking a face recognition system if your system does not have uh, a mechanism to detect these then uh, it is not very difficult to fool a face recognition system today and this is not only in theory in labs that is not the case today it's actually happening in the practical world i am sure you can relate to these two uh, image pairs that are there um, in the second row chachi 420 and mrs doubtfire these these movies were created long back right and again if you just look at mrs doubtfire or the chachi in the photo uh, if you do not know that the, these are um, there there's a lot of uh, accessories that have been used to create these it's going to be difficult right and like i said uh, um, it's not only in the movies or in labs that it is happening the two examples that you see on the right hand side in the in the second column these are actually real world cases that have happened in the us there was one african american person who disguised himself as uh, as a caucasian cop and uh, tried to commit a robbery in the second case it it was vice versa a caucasian person disguised himself as an african american it he was caught on the surveillance camera and for a reasonable period of time the police was looking for folks of different ethnicity in both the cases they were completely misguided by the ethnicity of the person and after a while they realized uh, in further investigation they, they realized what has happened and then they finally caught the culprit right but it's it's a reality uh, last year i think there was one incident that happened at the indian airport where um, a young person wanted to board a flight and um, 
he disguised himself as an elderly version of somebody else right and it was a very realistic image and he was finally caught by the authorities but he was definitely able to cross some checkpoints so it's it's all happening today right uh, in fingerprint and iris not only in faces but in fingerprint and iris as well we have uh, this example the image on this slide shows you life finger and gummy finger and gummy fingers are not very difficult to create today right uh, there's so many systems that are using fingerprints for uh, for a variety of tasks right related to aadhar fingerprints are getting used heavily and it's like i said it's not very difficult to generate gummy fingers with somebody's patterns so if you want to use any of these uh, authentication systems identity related systems it's important to have these mechanisms in built similarly for iris recognition these textured lenses that are there colored textured lenses if you and me if we if we wear the same lens it there is a non zero probability i mean there is more than 50% chance that we can share an identity right some of the lens creating companies the companies who who make these lenses they are also able to create lenses with a very specific texture let's say if i want to uh, generate um, a lens a contact lens with with my specific iris patterns they can do that it's going to be a bit more expensive a couple of thousand dollars but it is possible and people are doing it a lot of reasons for them to be doing it is medical reasons but uh, it can also be misused right so if it is a clear contact lens then uh, it it is not that i mean uh, then um, the chances of confusion or tampering is a lot lower but if you have this uh, colored contact lenses textured contact lenses then it is possible to share identities there is a good probability of being able to do that right so these are these are uh, sorry these are some of the physical attacks that are there and then like i said disguise accessories are definitely there after that we have uh, we could also there are digital alterations that can be made that can be performed uh, to spread misinformation or to cre uh, create these uh, alterations take a look at these again images do you recognize any of the faces here again these identities in person do not exist right but these are not completely fake these are morphed images generated from two images of celebrities right now if you look at morphing is a very uh, a very old technique right it has been there for a long time and has been used by researchers and other folks for a lot of different tasks now what we have shown is if you take the image on the right hand side as the database image then both of these persons can access individually uh the system and match their and uh the face recognition algorithm will show a match with the mock image so now again like i said in the iris using text contact lenses um using mock images people can share an identity right if there is uh, if there are um, digital uh, digital registrations happening you could use mock images in some ways if there is a way to get the mock image in the data set people can share an identity right and look again look at the quality of the morphed images it doesn't look like these are morphed images these look like real real, real world images right other other way of creating this information or generating uh, these falsified images is adversarial attacks and uh, i'll not go too much into this because uh, earlier we have uh, earlier also discussed but visually if you see you won't be able to spot any differences between these two pairs of images right the image on the left hand side is image of lena which is a very very uh, popularly used image in the image processing community and right hand side is a panda right uh, we can't see any visual differences but what has happened is that there are algorithms which can create imperceptible noises which are not visible to the human eye but they can be added to the images so that these deep learning algorithms which are supposedly very very accurate 
they would give you an uh, classification results for 98%, 99%. But with just these imperceptible noises, which have been learned very smartly in a targeted manner, right? These imperceptible noises can be added to the image to completely misclassify them. And after misclassification, the image is being predicted as a given rather than a panda. And look at the confidence level. It is predicted as given with a 99.3% confidence. The original image was predicted as panda with 57% confidence, and it is given with a 99.3% uh, confidence. So very high confidence. It is not even that I'm kind of confused. The algorithm is confused. It's at the boundary or anything of that sort. There's very high confidence that the image is misclassified, right? The same thing can be done. Similar kind of adversarial attacks can be added to images also, face images also. And uh, this four images uh, that you see on the right hand side, these are again adversarial images, uh, adversarially generated images. So first column is the original image. The next three columns are uh, images generated with adversarial attacks. And again, those attacks are not visible to us. And they are able to fool very sophisticated machine learning algorithms like ResNet 52, ResNet 152, Google Net, VGG 16. Right? There are there are uh, algorithms today. There are attacks that are that have been created. A single attack or a single noise can be used to misclassify a variety of images. Right? It, we can just learn a single noise vector, which can which can uh, Pool, uh, misclassify a lot of different classes, right? Or there are even attacks today where you can make, where you can just perturb a single pixel in an image of, let's say, size 32 plus 32. I can just perturb a single pixel and the identity is changed. The class of that image is changed, right? So perturbing a single pixel is anyways not, it's, it won't be visible in the image generated after the perturbation, right? So let's very quickly see how it works. If I take a very uh, standard example or a, a simple example, not a standard example, but a simple example of how this adversarial perturbation works, take an example of um, email prediction and my classification task is, I want to classify between spam and ham, okay? This, there is this message now, email, uh, email is from spammer at example.com and the subject of the image is chief mortgage now. This is obviously uh, a spam email, right? What are the what are the uh, keywords there? The keywords are chief and mortgage, right? Based on these two keywords from the subject, you can tell whether it is a spam or not, right? Now, I am a spammer. I want to send this email across to your inboxes, okay? What do I do? I know that as, as an attacker, let's say I know that there is this feature weight. Okay, every feature or every keyword has a specific weight. In this case, let's say the word cheap has a weight of one, mortgage has a weight of 1.5. Okay, now I want to be able to, and uh, based on the, so, so the total score is 2.5. And my threshold is one. So anything greater than one, I'm going to assign it as spam. Anything less than that, I'm going to assign it as a ham. Now, if I want to misclassify this spam message as ham and be able to send it to your inboxes, what can I do? A very simple trick could be, I'm going to add random words to the mail, to the message, which are positive. Right? For example, I added two words, joy and Oregon. Joy is a positive word. Oregon is a name of, is, is a name, right? So uh, obviously these will have positive weights. Let's say, uh, when I say positive weights, it means weights towards the ham class, okay? So joy has a weight of minus one. Oregon has a weight of minus one. Total score became 0.5. And it is it is below the threshold, and my I, the your spam filter will not classify this message anymore as a spam. Rather, it becomes a ham, and it gets through. Right. So something as simple as this can be used for misclassification. Right. Now, let's take this and see how it operates in a neural network because a lot of adversarial examples that we are generating today are with respect to neural networks.
So how does a neural network work with respect to adversarial learning, right? This is a very uh, simple architecture of neural network. And what it does is there are a lot of different nodes in a neural network which contribute to final prediction, right? Now, in this entire network, some of the nodes play major role, some of the nodes do not play such major role, okay? Like uh, there would be a higher weight assigned to some nodes, lesser weight assigned to some other nodes, okay? So what we can do is we can understand and analyze the weights of each of these nodes. Now in this graph, if you take a look at it, then I have 8,000 nodes. This is your x-axis at the bottom, okay? Total I have 8,000 nodes and I have the y-axis shows, y-axis on the left-hand side, it is showing me the accuracy, okay? So, and I have the strength of the nodes on the right-hand side. The z-axis is showing me the node strength. What is the strength of each node, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take these, this uh, architecture, I have analyzed this architecture and I'm going to drop some of these nodes. Okay, if I drop some of these nodes in the ascending order, let's say, uh, so I dropped one node, two node, 2000 nodes, 3000 nodes, until the point I am around 5000 nodes, take a look at the accuracy on the top. The accuracy around is around 60%, right? It's not dropping because a lot of these nodes are inactive. See, I have arranged them in the order of their activity. So the initial ones that you see on, in the, on the beginning of the x-axis are the nodes which do not carry too much of value. I can say they are inactive nodes, right? And the active nodes are towards the right-hand side, okay? If I drop as much as 5,000 inactive nodes, the performance is not reducing too much, right? There's a, there's a very minor drop when I, re, when I reach around uh, 4,800, 5,000. But if I go beyond that, if I drop some of the active nodes, then the performance drops significantly, right? So if I can analyze some of the active nodes, the nodes which are active, right? And if I perturb those active nodes, now I don't need to make changes in 5,000. If I can just make a few changes in the active nodes, I'll be able to misclassify the algorithm. So this art of adversarial learning is about learning those points, learning those active nodes, and figuring out what kind of perturbations I need to make, right? So if I can, if I can change these active nodes, I, if I can identify and change the, these active nodes, I can lead to misclassifications, right? Something as simple as that. It's an iterative process, obviously, but if you have access, you can do it, right? So you can find out the nodes which are important and suppress their effect by perturbing the inputs that are going to these specific um, active nodes, right? So I can create adversarial networks in that in this manner and take this example to input images like loin, image of a race car, image of a traffic light. This is on the right hand side, you see the confidence which, which, which they are predicted 99%, 74%, right? And if I add an adversarial noise, I can misclassify them. Right? And these are the, uh, the images on the right that you see here. This is actually the noise that is added. And it seems to be a completely black image with very little, with very little non-black pixels. And still we, we can mis make a misclassification to this extent, right? Uh, Pelican, speedboat, and genes, nothing to do with, with the input images that are there, right? So if you, if you look at it mathematically, uh, this, is what we, this is what we are trying to do, that you have model parameters, input features, and label vector, and you are trying to minimize the error, right? That is what your loss function generally is. But in, when we are trying to perturb this, what we are doing is, I'm going to maximize the error, right? Rather than minimizing the loss function, now I'm going to maximize the error. And I don't, uh, I don't necessarily have to alter the entire image. I, there are a lot of different algorithms that have been designed now where you can make them very specific and sophisticated. Like I only want to change, if I, if I talk about the image at the bottom, I only want to change the stop sign. I don't want to change anything else in the image. So I can create a mask that only operates in that region and makes perturbations there, I will not touch the remaining part of the image. 
Similarly, in this mask that you have, I can I can pull out very specific regions where I want to make changes targeted, like the sig sign of Apple. Rather than the sign of Apple, I want to misclassify it to something else. Right? If I'm if I can misclassify it to something else, I, I just need to make the change in that small Apple region. I don't need to change anything else there, right? So Actually, these camouflage there are camouflage stickers that are being made, and they are being sold also. You can put them on stick on your uh, t-shirts. You can wear dresses today. There are dresses that are coming up with camouflage, where surveillance cameras will not be able to track you. So, so surveillance cameras there are algorithms there that can perform person detection, right? I can put in uh, if I wear some of these camouflage dresses, specifically designed dresses. The surveillance cameras will not be able to track me anymore, right? So that is where your uh, adversarial attack generation algorithms are going. And uh, if I if I take it further and I talk about facial reenactment and generative adversarial networks and GAN and deep fakes, this is where the technology is going. So what we have done is I have taken the image, uh, I've taken the videos of two persons. So the first one is a random actor that I have, source actor whose expressions I'm putting on the target actor's face and the output you see on the right-hand side. Random, I can make anybody portray random expressions, right? This is your real-time enactment that uh, uh, we could show another president doing. I can, you can make them say anything, right? These are, uh, I don't remember the actual video, but the faces of one of my students. Right? This one, I'm sure you remember the movie. And again, this is another of my students. And this is just done in the lab with normal computers, right? And this is, uh, again, the, this is a very recent video that has come in. I don't need input videos. I can just give the text information. The, the text is just input text is alpine mountains covered with snow and I get this beach wave with sand and I can create the video that is running on the right hand side. If you're not happy, just run it again and you cloudy skies. I can generate the videos with just giving input as sketches. You remember when we were kids, we used to draw these. You can take your kids drawing and convert them into these beautiful videos and images today. This is the effectiveness of generative adversarial networks today. And if you are given any such video, the task is you need to be able to tell me whether the video is fake or real. Go back to, go back to the source uh, task that we were there, misinformation detection, right? With the improving efficacy of GANs and deep fakes, the challenge for differentiating between real and fakes becomes more and more difficult. These are all generated images, right? So uh, coming to this, so the core problem is how do you actually detect mis misinformation in the visual world? And the current problem is we have scarcity of liberal data and there is deceptive and very diverse style of creation. I've shown you some in some ways and within each of these sections that I showed you, physical, GANs, deep fakes, adversarial attacks, there is a plethora of algorithms that have been uh, proposed by researchers. So within adversarial attack, there are hundreds of algorithms. Within GANs, there are hundreds of different types of GANs that have been proposed by the community, right? So what my group is doing right now is generating algorithms for detecting these kinds of attacks. So when we started early um, work, working on this um, earlier around 2010, 11, we started working on specific attacks. For example, if there are physical alterations, uh, face detection, uh, do you have presentation attack? This is called a spoofing or presentation attacks in face. Detect specific uh, attacks, right? Or detect specific digital attacks. And uh, more recently, we started working on detecting deep fakes, detecting adversarial attacks, detecting uh, detecting images generated by GANs, right? And there are two different kinds of algorithms that, that broadly have been proposed. It could be learning-based algorithms that have, uh, that take the data, right? Training data. And uh, so the training data in this case would be a lot of real images and a lot of uh, perturbed images, right? That, that have been generated. And you learn the variations from there, right? 
The second kind of algorithms are your good old statistical algorithms that actually learn the properties of real images and probable images. What are the challenges uh, of both of these? If these are learning based algorithms, one thing is you require a lot of data. The second thing, the second challenge with learning based algorithms are these, these are going to learn from the data that is given to you, right? If I just provided data of physical alterations or specific kind of physical alterations, digital alterations, it's going to learn from that, right? But it is not necessary that you are aware your training data contains samples from all different kinds of perturbations, right? So that is where the challenge with learning based algorithms comes. And with statistical algorithms, uh, the, the characteristics, you, you have good differentiating characteristics of real and perturbed, but with efficiency of these fake images that are getting generated, GANs images, artificial images that are getting generated, that um, difference is getting a bit minimized, right? And uh, so, so what we have recently started doing is we have recently started to work on unified algorithms for detecting different kinds of attacks, different kinds of deep fakes, right? And one very important thing that is required in all of this is it should be bias invariant. For example, if the algorithm, uh, your algorithm should be able to detect these attacks irrespective of whether the image is coming from, whether the image belongs to, if I talk about face images, the image belongs to which subgroup? Is it, uh, is it for elderly? Is it for kids? Is it for Caucasians? Is it for Indians, Chinese? Who does it belong to? Your algorithm should be able to work well in all kinds of scenarios and for different kinds of defake attacks also, right? So, so one thing that we are doing is different kinds of defakes and then if I go back to the previous slide of different kinds of defects, you also need to have a unified algorithm for all kinds of misinformation detection or different kinds of anomaly detection. So a unified algorithm, because you would not know in the practical world, in the real world, you would not know that which is the attack that has happened. Is it adversarial or is it actually defect, right? So you can't run individual algorithms for individual attacks that after a while that will not be pragmatic. So uh, that this is something that we're currently working on detecting unified attacks. And uh, last year we had uh, uh, generated this uh, one framework. We had uh, the paper was published in IEEE transaction where we proposed something called as DAMAR. Okay, so it is data agnostic, it is model agnostic and it is attack agnostic. And we, we it was specifically for, uh, we tested it on a bunch of different face data sets and object recognition data sets and digit data sets um, that, that exist in the community. So it is working, but uh, there is, uh, it is working well. We are getting 90%, 95% accuracies, but there's still a lot of scope. And these are on specific data sets. But if you actually take it to the real world, then uh, you need that bias, you need the explainability, all of that which is um, which where there is a long way to go still. So what this algorithm was doing was it was actually a combination of learning based and statistical properties. So we created these two ensembles, which was uh, based on uh, deep learning, a, con a convolutional neural network. And then from that, we, we uh, learned um, statistical features from that. So this combination of algorithms. So the, our first block was dense net model and our second deep learning block was uh, nonlinear embedding that we extracted from autoencoders. And this combined block was able to give us very good results because at the end of the day, we combined, like you can see in the first figure, we combined the results from, from both of these uh, individual experts. So ensemble based algorithm gave us good results in this case, and that is the direction we are currently pursuing for further extending, right? And sorry, and uh, for, for details of this, uh, you can go you can refer to the transaction paper, it's available on the website. And another direction that we are currently pursuing is uh, fake news is not always just images, right? Fake news is a collection of, uh, often you will have images as well as text, depending on what is available to you, right? So it could be images, it could be text, it could be audio, video. So can we work towards a multimodal fake news detection approach, which can take whatever information is available to you and make connections on that. So for that, we proposed uh, something called the news value 
the extended version of that called as Newspack Plus Plus. And it has um, two lakh uh, real images, two, sorry, two lakh real news articles and uh, close to four fake news, text and images together. Right. So uh, the data is publicly available and we, then we actually started working on it. Uh, these were the accuracies that we were getting. So when you actually evaluate it on training data set, we, we were close to 74%. But on the testing data set for news back, the news back first version was a smaller data set. Our accuracy was close to 70%. On the extended data set, it was it is 61%. So, so this is another thing that we are currently working on and uh, combining the results for uh, text, uh, images, video. Audio is another thing that uh, that can be worked upon. It has a lot of different scope. And just to end, this is not where the field ends. Right? Just, it's not only that you have to just detect where the misinformation is coming, uh, whether it is whether it is fake news or it is real news. Right? If I take it to one step further, as an investigator, I would also like to analyze where this image is coming from. Right. So take a look at the images in the first row. These are your real images, right? But what I can do is I can combine portions of images from these three to create the images that you see at the bottom in the middle row, right? So instead of the trucks, I have replaced those trucks uh, by the animals. And in the second example, I have replaced the chairs with the trucks. And in the third one, I have put the person in between the. If I if I get let's say an Ma'am, Ma'am, you're muted. Richa, Ma'am, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I got muted. And just, just for a very short time. Okay, so this field of research is called as image provenance analysis. And this is a very interesting and um, challenging area of work, but has a lot of value in that, right? So uh, figuring out where the images are from, okay? And the way we see it, it's actually a cat and mouse game because the more you improve the algorithm, detection algorithms, the generative adversarial networks and uh, adversarial attacks and all of those algorithms are also improving in efficacy, right? At the end of the day, a lot of these are machine learning algorithms. So, so each of us are benefiting from that. And uh, so that this uh, Tom and Jerry makes it a lot more interesting. There are a lot of government efforts that are also going in, uh, like Responsible AI for all the document that has come out from Niti Aayog and uh, other governments are also working on these lines. So that is very important. And um, at the end, I would like to thank my students and my collaborators uh, who have played a very active role in working on all of these research areas that my lab is pursuing. Currently. So with that, thank you very much for the time and I'll be happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for a very interactive session. Some of the examples are very amusing. <laughs> yes, we yes. we enjoy the session very much. So um, uh, the as of now, there aren't any questions in the chat box. Uh, we can probably wait a minute or two to see if uh, are there any questions? If there are, please post them on the chat box. There aren't any questions, ma'am. Uh, 
Uh, so I, I would like to thank you again uh, for uh, accepting our invitation and for giving us the presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Richa. This is Sarath from SETS. It's a very interesting you know, uh, talk and it was quite uh, useful to us. We look forward to work with you more closely in our uh, A for cyber security area. Definitely, definitely, Dr. Sarath. Thank you very much. May our regards to Professor Santanu. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. We now uh, break for the lunch uh, session and we will rejoin. Uh, uh, there are four more speakers, uh, so the, we will have the lunch session till 2. We'll have the lunch break till 2, 2 p.m. So we'll rejoin at 2 p.m. I request uh, all the participants to rejoin at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>